Hi, Elena. How how you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you today? I'm doing well. Welcome to, um, this is actually a part of a new series that I'm doing. So you're the first voice that comes on. And these are conversations that we're having with people that are experiencers, people who have important stories and people who can give us background information that informs conversations that are currently going on and probably even long running memes as well. You, uh, you and I kind of got to know each other in a uh, former secret space program group that I was in for just a very short time. And then as a result of that, we got to talk a little bit. So you define yourself as an experiencer of, uh, and a participant in the secret space program. That's the solar warden program as well. Is that correct? Not in Solar Warden, ICC, okay. Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate. I was never in Solar Warden. Okay. All right. Maybe we, we can talk a little bit about the differences between the two programs. Sure. Let, pe let people know a little bit about where they can find you so that we get that out up front. Yeah. I have a website, Messages from a Star Traveler. Um, it's hosted for free on Wix.com. It has been since 2015. Um, what I started doing on that website originally was sharing my ET contact experiences. That's how the website started. Then I mm -hmm. added on um, mid-2015, mid I added on the SSP stuff and the ICC stuff. So it kept on growing and growing. And then I also started doing a YouTube channel. I actually started doing private recordings of interviews and releasing it online on Awakening Cosmic Reality Show. So, and I put my own podcast as well up there, interviews, um, whatever, whatever was happening in my life with the ET contacts, with the SSP stuff. I was just putting all that out there on um, my website and on my YouTube channel. Let's go back to um, maybe a good place to start probably is your ET contacts, because that seems to be where a lot of us start in yeah. remembrance of the ET contacts and then it kind of opens up from there as yeah. kind of an expanding kaleidoscope box of things that we discover so tell us a little bit about how how long ago how far back and what your experiences were well the ET stuff started happening when I was two mm -hmm. um, I was abducted by the reptilians so that's started way back when I was a small kid. They did genetic experiments on me. They infested me with 36,000 nanites, which is nanomaterial technology, and it slowly eats up your body. It enters your bloodstream, and it eats your body. It impacts your nervous system. It impacts your autoimmune system. So you're constantly sick, and they wanted to kill me, basically. Uh, the Sharab Invictus reptilians, the yellow ones, 12 feet tall, and the um, Black Draza reptilians, 14 feet tall. So those are the two prominent reptilians that I remember mm -hmm. that abducted me, and they took me into underground bases uh, in Europe near the Rostov area, which is actually a military, that was a military zone until 2010. So, um, and it was in secret bases underground, and they did a lot of genetic experimentation. I remember there were other children chained to the walls of those bases, and it was human-run bases, but they allowed the ETs to, to do their stuff there as well. So that's what I largely remember from that time, from 2 to 10. And I was living in the Ukraine, um, when I was, until I was four, then I moved to Israel when I was six. So the reptilian abductions uh, happened until I was 10. And I was afraid to, uh, to be at home alone or to even be in the dark in my own room because they take me at night. Mm -hmm. That's when the abductions would usually happen. So that was my first introduction to ETs, to the reptilians. Now, how, how often, how persistent and for how long did you experience those type of abductions every couple of weeks okay yeah um and i would constantly uh, as a child i would be sick i would have the flu i would have something happening to me where i was sick so i wasn't a healthy kid uh because of these experiments 
because this nanite technology can be used to heal people or it can be used to damage your body and destroy you. Tell us a little bit about your genetic background. Is there markers within your genetics that indicate this type of experience as well? Well, it, I'm negative, okay. uh, O negative. Right. So, um, and I, I have memories of, of being a star traveler, of being an ET, actually. So I'm not, a, I'm not originally from this planet. I'm not an earthbound soul incarnate. So my genetic markers have um, ET stuff in it. So mm -hmm. that's partially why the SSP was interested in me. And the reptilians just wanted to stop me from completing my, um, my life mission here on Earth. That's primarily why they infested me with the nanites, because they didn't want me doing what I'm currently doing, actually. Now, how did you discover the nanites? And how do you know the number of those nanites, Elena? Um, I'm an intuitive and I'm okay. an empath, so I could feel that there was something wrong every month I would bleed out, like I would hemorrhage out. Um, so, and the nanites was, were concentrated in my uterus and cervix. So I would have low iron. I would just, I had, um, pernicious anemia. I would just bleed out in, uh, in times where I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I started hemorrhaging, so I had to have my uterus and cervix removed. And I just intuitively felt the nanites were removed. Once the uterus was gone, the nanites were gone, and everything started becoming normal. No more bleeding, no, no more blood loss, no more anemia, no more feeling sick. So you, you believe then that they were localized to that area? Yes. That's yeah. interesting. Because I couldn't walk or and I couldn't get out of bed. I was so weak and tired all the time. Mm -hmm. Basically, I was useless. Like, I would miss a lot of work. I would miss a lot of... I couldn't even go anywhere. I would miss on so many different activities because of this stuff. And um, I did talk to some channelers, some psychics, some healers. I, I went everywhere, basically. And one of the healers told me, what, well, I can see you have 36,000 nanites in your body, in your uterus in particular. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm getting the surgery. Um, so I was proactively seeking help and trying to figure out what is this? Why is this going on? And I could, I even took, uh, native, I studied and took Native American shamanism to, to help myself mm -hmm. naturopathically. Um, and I studied alternative medicine, anything I could get my hands on to heal myself. Because I don't believe in taking um, mainstream medications, and it, I, my body can't handle yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So I had to do it all naturopathically. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Because um, I'm the same way. I can't really deal with uh, any type of pharmaceutical or invasive medical technology at all. I've never been able to deal with it. And uh, blood issues, you know, that's pretty interesting too. Um, so at about what age then did you, do you believe you became involved with the SSP? That would be in the age of 16. Okay. Were you before that period of time to your knowing being tested, targeted, or otherwise um, isolated by particular government programs? I remember Monarch Solutions taking me somewhere out near the Sierra Madre Mountains. That's like below New Mexico border and not too far away from Texas. It's, it's down lower in that area. I remember being taken to two different bases. One was a secret weapons base and another one was a sonar facility of some sort sonar testing facility, and they would uh, put drugs in my brain to try to turn my brain into a supercomputer and uh, augment my psychic abilities so they could um, see how I would naturally open up star gateway portals, walk into those portals, and end up somewhere else on the planet. So that's, that's what they were mainly testing me for. 
how well my psychic abilities worked, my remote viewing abilities, what I could see in blind targets. Um, they wanted to see how much I could do and how far they could push me. They would drown me continuously in water to see how long I could keep my breath underwater and if there would be any brain damage or not, um, how well I would um, take it under pressure, um, how much pain I could take, how high was my pain threshold and tolerance. Um, at the end of that stuff, I couldn't even feel pain. Like if you, if you stabbed my hand, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel that I was bleeding. It's just so numb. The skin is just so numb to pain. I don't even feel it anymore. Yeah, that seems to be common with people who've come out of programs uh, that they have very high thresholds of pain, even to the point of being able to walk around with injuries the where that should be immobilizing them. Uh, yeah. Uh, Emily I had, and I talk about this a lot. Yeah, when I had my hysterectomy, when the uterus and the cervix were removed, you usually stay a day or two in the hospital I just said, take that catheter out of me. It feels uncomfortable. I just want to go home. And I went home the next day. And I just mm -hmm. started walking around. Like, I didn't even feel the pain. I'm like, I'm so, I'm so glad I'm pain. Like, I don't feel anything. It's great. After the surgery, it wasn't painful for me. And I didn't take the pain meds. Because some people, you know, when you've had the organs removed, it's so painful. You, like, you have to take those pain meds, uh, anti-inflammatories. I couldn't take those. Because I just, I'd, I'd throw them up. So I just didn't take it and I didn't feel much pain. Good move. Because that stuff's yeah. addictive anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I just don't respond well to any type of medication. No, I don't either. And I don't take drugs well at all. My body is hyper intolerant of it. So I don't, general, I had surgery 2013 um, I had to have this surgery done because of a localized infection in my elbow. And, mm -hmm. they, you know, obviously they give you uh, opiates, massive amounts of opiates. And I was like cutting the things in quarters just to get through the post-trauma. And even then it felt like I just, you know, really couldn't handle it. It's yeah. uh, the, the pills just, you know, it put me too far out of, out of my consciousness. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other thing was that, you know, I really felt like I could, I, I learned how to go through pain and to use pain, how to basically ride waves of pain and come over the other. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes I have migraines. I just ride mm -hmm. it out until it passes and I, yeah. I can't take anything for it anyway. So I just let it ride it out and let it pass. I mean, I even tried um, cannabis CBD marijuana mm -hmm. and it made my migraines worse it didn't help <laughs> the cannabis didn't help me so wow. i get i can't even take marijuana even though that's, that's interesting good. that's interesting it's supposed, be, it's supposed to be good for you and actually yeah. healing it heals cancer the cbd is very different than the um the uh activated cannabinoids too the cbd is actually the other kind of left-handed cannabis mm -hmm. Um, I yeah. found that, that that actually is how I got through post-surgical pain was using cannabis. Yeah, I, I couldn't, uh, I vaped it. I tried vaping it, yeah. not directly yeah. smoking it. Even yeah. with the weight vaping, I could feel my migraine getting worse instead wow. of better. And my hand went numb. I'm like, this stuff, like I wanted to try it because I heard so many good things about it. Um, and it was the good stuff. Like I, I went, I looked everywhere and I got the good stuff. Uh, it, it just wasn't for me. Yep. Everybody's body's different and some people, well, every, you know, our bodies have been altered and mm -hmm. that makes a big difference. Yes, um, it does. With the removal of the, of your uterus, did you just, and the, obviously the nanites, how did you feel after the removal? How did you feel in the absence of the nanites themselves? Were you aware of them? And were you yeah. aware of their, their absence? Yeah, I was quite aware of the nanites because it would create so much pain in the uterus. It was like the uterus was inflamed always. Mm -hmm. Like always, no matter what, it was inflamed. Um, once it was removed, 
no inflammation because the nanites were removed along with the uterus. So uh, no more inflammation, no more stomach being enlarged and, you know, feeling pain in the back constantly, like every day for four years. That's, I felt the inflammation and the back pain. And I just worked through it. And the moment the nanites were gone, that went away. And I was good. I was like able to function properly. And I was not sick. So now we can move forward a little bit. Did you continue to have ET experiences after you went into SSP? Yeah, I've always had ET experiences ever since I was small, like from two. Um, it never really stopped until recently when I told them to leave me alone. Because some of the ET experiences are not pleasant and reptilians are continually involved. Yes, yes, yes. Even in the SSP, mm -hmm. they have human reptilian hybrids in the SSP yeah. working with the ICC in conjunction with them and the dark fleet. So I'm like, I don't want this anymore. I just want to be left alone. You told them to leave you alone. Yes. I said, yeah. you do not, you do not have yeah. permission to visit me. And yeah. I told the programs the same thing. You do not have permission to take me. And now I have a whole huge list, like Earth Defense Force, Mars Defense Force, ICC, SSP, Dark Fleet. You cannot touch me. And certain other ET factions, you just can't come near me. Because I don't want this anymore. It's amazing how that works. Uh, once you understand your own legal authority, mm -hmm. you know, somehow or another, I've seen it work. With ETs, I've seen it work with demonic entities, and I've seen it work with uh, government programs. Not perfectly, but mm -hmm. um, in the case of the ETs, they'll, they'll at least stop. And sometimes they're kind of sneaky. The little bastards will try to come back in, but um, you have yeah. to keep asserting your, your legal sovereignty yes. when dealing um, with them. And if you don't want them in your house, if you don't want them taking you, just say no. Free will. Like, I don't want this. You, yeah. by the name, you have to invoke their name and say, you cannot do this to me. I don't want this. I have free will. I have yeah. sovereignty. No. So you, you, you understand yourself as being a non-terrestrial, sort of a, a, a traveler, a person who really isn't a native soul to this world. Do you think that uh, somehow this is all connected to that identity as well in terms of both negative ET and SSP trying to basically tap into that background as well? Yes, it's all connected because um, the ICC actually wanted my ET memories. They wanted to tap into those memories and see what I was like as an ET, because these, these memories, these ET memories are in um, their cellular memories. So they're part of the body. They're part of the soul essence that this being is who I am right now. And I, what I remember of the ET stuff that I was in previous lifetimes. So they wanted to tap into that and they actually wanted to get secrets out of me, classified ET secrets. So they kept on putting me into these, memory pod technology into this um, medical beds, holographic medical pods to try mm -hmm. to, yep. to access those ET memories of my lifetimes. Um, and the reason why the ICC took me in the first place, because I was not an earthbound soul. They wanted the ET stuff. They wanted those abilities. They wanted to harness that and use that in the program for their own advantage in their own projects. So that's why they took me in the first place. So that played a huge role. And I got access to the ET memories in 2013 when I started doing uh, past life regression sessions with my native um, American shaman teacher, Leonard Howell. Mm -hmm. And he taught me how to do this. And I, I'm, I'm certified to do past life regression and to do soul retrieval. That's, that's the um, part of the Native American shamanism mm -hmm. aspect of it. So that's how I became aware of my, um, that I was not earthbound spirit. The reason I ask you that has to do with some other things that we talk about. And, you know, in a way I wish Emily was here because sometimes she's kind of my memory jogger. 
but we've talked um, a lot both between ourselves and with other people about the fact that we have this sense, I would call it a knowing that we were profiled coming in at birth. In other words, um, they have a technology that enables them to track souls through lifetime cycles and to basically identify people that they're interested in pre-incarnation. Yes. And so um, you know, that seems to be intuitively and just based on what I've learned about the technology that they have, it makes a great deal of sense because almost everybody uh, reports their experiences starting extremely young. Mine go back to three years old. Mm -hmm. You're talking about two years old. I yeah. mean, I was with, um, I was with a person who was a, a, a deprogrammer out in Arizona in 2010. And he was stunned when I told him I remembered even being three years old, much less remembering detailed memories. Well, it's interesting because I have a photographic memory. So I remember mm -hmm. everything that ever happened in my life, the good mm -hmm. stuff, the bad stuff, the nasty and everything in between. I remember all of it. And uh, I have to put it in little compartments so it doesn't, you know, uh, interfere with my daily life. I just, you have to learn if you have yeah. photographic memory, you have to learn how to, how to put it aside, even though you have the memories that you're not always just focused in on that, what happened to you in the past, that you actually live your current lifetime and not focus on everything that ever happened to you. Because you don't always need to be looking at that stuff continually on and on. It yeah, I, I, what I find interesting about it is the level of detail. It may not always be perfect in the sense that I remember everything, but when I recall something, the detail is extreme. Yeah. It's like wallpaper on the wall, very specific things inside of a room, light, sounds, the general feel of something. It's almost like a sensory download that comes with a memory. It's not just like, like a snapshot like people think. Yeah, definitely. It's like you go backwards and you actually review, you, you're watching a video of your you're own watching life. watching yourself, yes. Yes. Yeah. Some people have the ability to go backwards and, and do that, mm -hmm. to, to, yeah. to access certain specific memories all the way down to the smell, the sound, the taste of something, and really get clearly see that and actually relive it. Yeah. It's like you're virtually yeah. there again. And it's like a holographic reenactment of that time and yeah very it's, it's much hap it's happening in your brain because your brain is differently wired if you have that self-awareness it kind of it's like it's almost wired differently so you can experience doing that so going through your memories there's clearly a time like you said 15 years old you are basically coming into contact with the project. And I just use project as a blanket kind of terminology because a lot of people are coming out of different projects that may or may not have been touching on SSP. The more I'm mm -hmm. starting to understand this, the more I'm realizing that really what we're dealing with is a pretty wide array of sub projects, some of which are not named. Some of them are closely docketed. Some of them are so compartmentalized that m people are not aware of exactly what inner lap was going on with the project. So when you identify, you're calling this ICC, right? Yeah. Okay. And what does that mean exactly again? Inter, inter, okay. ICC, inter, in, <laughs> Interplanetary corporate conglomerate. It's a mouthful, so I stumble uh -huh. on it sometimes. That's a, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a mouthful. Interplanetary corporate conglomerate. Um, and what they are is that they have shareholder companies here on Earth, like Amerisource Virgin, which is a pharmaceutical company, Boeing, um, Monsanto, just to name a few of the Lockheed Martin. I could Lockheed get down. Martin, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, Douglas. Yeah. Douglas. Um, yeah. They have a few culprits that are, to name a few, Merck. You know, all, all the big wig corporations that are heavily involved in uh, GMOs, 
um, geoengineering, you know, food, uh, pharmaceuticals, those companies, they're the big ones that are the ICC shareholders on Earth. And there's also off-planet ICC on Mars in particular. They have a lot of bases. Like, I remember 11 in total. They have, um, and they have a base on the moon as well. Okay. For some reason, they don't have much basis on the moon. They just have like one or two. It's a lot of activity on Mars, huh? Yes, that's their primary holdings where they do their stuff. They have their uh, Mars basis, which is kind of military-like. That's what I remember. You're like um, in, you're in this huge uh, one room that has 12 bunks, and you're put together in a work team of 12 people. And that's the work team you work with on, on a project that you're assigned for a month, a year, whatever. And then you're switched off to, into a different working team. And you stick with those people for the duration of your project, whatever you're working on. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it was set up for me, basically. So you're in this room with 12 people. 12 bunks, that's where you sleep every night, that's where you eat every night, and then you share one or two bathrooms next door with those same people. So you're brought into the program and then deployed. Is there a training process that you go through for this? Yeah, yeah. Um, they want to see what you're good at. Mm -hmm. uh, they gave me um, combat training in weaponry, in firearms, uh, swords, uh, guns, knives. I didn't really like it. It's, it's, and they call it being battle ready training. Mm -hmm. um, supposedly they were training, training me to be an assassin and to infiltrate various different ET groups, especially the Mars colonists, and to, to make friends with them and report back, spy on them, and report back to the ICC um, what the heck they're doing and because they wanted to take them off planet and put them on the Mars Orbiter Station so the ICC mm -hmm. could have Mars all to themselves. Um, so I was used as a gopher, as a spying gopher, unwittingly, because I had Neuralink implants that would record everywhere I went, what I was doing, who I was interacting with, where, where I had my missions, all trainings. It was recorded video and audio in through the implants and reported back to the ICC on the Mars basis. So you would be going for extended periods of time, right? And yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so obviously we're going to deal here with the time issue. And oh your, yeah. Your, your real world life and the overlap and what goes on with that. So, you know, tell me a little bit about how, how that gets managed. Well, I remember it as being 60 years on Mars in the 11 Mars basis and some of the off-planetary stuff training on ships as well. In that, in the ICC, SSP, I remember 60 years. Um, so you have that. But I also know I went to college, I went to high school, and I remember all of that. Mm -hmm. So I had a life. I had an mm -hmm. earth life. Yes. So somehow what they're able is to manipulate time and take you out of time. It's like, a, for me, it was time jumping quantum leap program. That's what the ICC, they took me out of human time and put me into Mars time. Mm -hmm. They can insert me back and forth anytime they want it on earth or on Mars. I was never told that the planet, that earth was destroyed. I was never given that spiel. So I knew earth was there. I knew everybody was alive and well on Earth because for some people they were told when they this is it for you. you. This is your home now. This is your permanent home. You are now to live on these bases or to live on the Mars colonies and that's it. You have nowhere else to go. I was never told that. I always knew that Earth was still there and that everybody was alive on the planet. I was never given that manipulation spiel that the planet had been destroyed. Um, so I knew that they could return me to Earth at any time, but I also knew that they liked keeping me on the Mars basis because they wanted me to process information, they wanted me to spy on other groups, 
and um, you know, bring it all back to them and report on it. So what other groups were there? Are we talking uh, extraterrestrial groups, other Earth groups, competing corporations? What? Well, from what I can remember uh, on Mars, there are um, secret space program, SSP bases. They have their own bases. Mm -hmm. Then the ICC has their bases, a lot of them, more, than, more so than the SSP. And there's a few dark fleet bases as well on, um, on Mars and a couple on the moon. Um, but the dark fleet is mostly uh, outside the solar system now. That's their domain. Because Mars is ICC, strictly interplanetary corporate conglomerate. They're the ones that rule the roost, so to speak. So what's their line of business? What are, what are you doing? Are you doing mining operations? Are you doing... Uh, they do mining. They do uh, build-outs of their bases, advanced technology, medicine. Um, also, they've branched off into transhumanism and making cyborgs out of um, people. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, trade off the cyborgs with other ETs, tall greys. That's one of the groups they trade with. Um, and what they basically want is to give out their great technology for even to get even more advanced technology, reverse engineer it, and put it into uh, working whatever, into working on the assembly line and out, out to their programs. Um, what they also like to do is outsource their own assets. Say so another, the SSP needs you know, a specialist in something, they'll outsource one of their assets in exchange for, for some SSP personnel. They do trades with other groups as well in the, these programs. So are, the, are we limited to just Mars or are there other, other worlds, other domains, other places that, that you know of that they're also doing business on? Oh yeah, Pluto. They okay. have a... Uh, program on Pluto, the ICC, and they work with time travel technology. So it's not just limited to Mars. So a lot of what we hear is that this is a breakaway civilization, but it doesn't feel to me like they are a breakaway so much as they are, uh, I'll just use the word parasitic, it's truly exploitative, but they, are they to your knowledge, building an actual civilization somewhere, is there some plan to jettison Earth and build a civilization away um, from the, Earth? the ICC doesn't have any plans to jettison Earth because they still, they make money on this planet. Okay. It, it's, it's, and they can abduct people as assets from Earth to use and then return back anytime they want. So uh, Earth is a viable source of, of people, people, and people to be used by these programs. Dark Fleet has branched off and made their own civilization. They have cities, like huge metropolitan cities on other planets outside the solar system. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Like I was in some city. I don't remember the planet. I remember city, huge city and these cigar-shaped circular craft traveling above the cities. And that was definitely the dark fleet because they, they have a way of camouflaging their bases with shielding. So you can't even see the base from space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. shielded magnetically. And they have these huge um, magnetic towers that provide that shielding, holographic shielding. Mm -hmm. So it just looks like ground, that there's nothing actually there, but their cities are built out and they're shielded. So you can't see anything from space where their cities and bases are. I guess the hardest thing I struggle with is the money aspect of this and the wealth aspect of it. You know, when, when you're in possession of advanced technology, which basically eliminates the need any longer for not even just basic needs, but I'm talking pretty much anything you desire in terms of a good life. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure out what, and you know, this, this goes kind of into the philosophical end of this whole thing, but it's, 
it's where my brain runs into a real issue because I'm just not wired this way. I don't think like this. That wealth, exceeding wealth, wealth beyond what even in earthly terms we can understand, is such a compelling force that they're basically running slavery operations and outlier colonies and interplanetary cartels just for money. It's the mindset of this, I, you know. Well, I don't think it's so much about the money on Mars. It's about um, building more technology, making advancements, and trading with the ETs. They don't trade for money with the ETs. They trade for, with human, um, human assets. Yeah. That's what they trade with. So ICCs, um, they make their money through their Earth shareholders because that's the way how you do it on Earth. Mm -hmm. So those companies still work in money. What happens on Mars, it's, it's, it's trading with goods and services, not necessarily money. Because mm -hmm. like, you can't give an ET paper dollar bills or, or gold or whatnot. An ET is right, not right, going to yeah. want your money. I get that. I get that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't know. Um, maybe it's just my consciousness and then maybe it's why I never really fit in with much of anybody's programs is that metaphysically, I really struggle with the concept of materialism at that scale. And then the exploitation of humans, which to me is the big story about why, we're, why we talk about all this stuff anyway. Yeah, humans are the collateral. That's not yeah. the money. The yeah. Humans are the, the trading collateral on Mars for, um, for soldiers, for scouts, and other nefarious sexual purposes um, because it's not just creating cyborgs. There's also sexual stuff that goes on there, yeah. um, especially the women are, uh, are given as that, as sexual slaves. And some people have uh, fragmented personalities when they're returned. So they have sexual proclivities. They have weird sexual memories of doing stuff they'd never do yeah. normally. Yeah. So the pedophilia is huge. It's just not well known. It's well hidden on Mars. Here, not so much anymore. It's kind of crawling, creeping outward. Yeah, it really that, is, isn't it? It's yeah that there's this stuff. I mean, there's porn for free online. Anybody, if right. you're addicted to porn, yep. you can get it for free. It doesn't cost you anything. So th there's all kinds of addictive stuff that's available online. You have the internet, you get access to almost virtually anything. But there's an, it, but you and I both know that there's an energetics that comes from, let's just say the real stuff. I mean, yeah. and it is, uh, we call it loose harvesting, energetic mm -hmm. harvesting, harvesting on the cellular level, but with with a type of energy that you know you don't get from anything so far that I know of in terms of let's say artificial stimulation. There's a there's a this is a power thing. This is a high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my I understand the the pedophilia thing pretty well. And I understand that that is a particular type of energetic juice that is so prized here, and I'm certain it is there too, that men's lives and careers are basically built on the currency of this. Something that's oh, yeah. very hard for most people to understand at all. Yeah, I mean, um, if you have sexual proclivities, never get caught. That's, that's, that's the thing, because what they do... Um, certain government officials there's cameras everywhere there's video and audio in everybody's offices everybody's being monitored and if you're caught participating in something you can be easily exposed as having a sexual addiction as being a predator whatnot you can be labeled as anything if there's footage of you doing something wrong it'll just be used against you as collateral to blackmail you that's just how it is Now we're back. Now you can hear yeah. me again. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
That's okay. Um, um, when, when you start talking about something interesting, something always happens to try to disrupt the flow. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And sometimes it's me with my fingers. But so, <laughs> again, you know, that is, you were saying earlier, you know, they, they have cameras, they have evidence. That is how the system runs because everybody's corrupted. Everybody is blackmailable. Everybody's yeah. been pulled into this. You know, mm -hmm. the situations are as unique as the people themselves. And we're all human, mm -hmm. but we all can be compromised, even unwillingly. And now, I mean, <laughs> given what can be done with virtual reality and, I mean, just Photoshop, but even beyond that, everybody is blackmailable, and that's the flaw of the system. Yeah. The system is running on a currency of, of, of human human trafficking at a scale that uh pizzagate peter gate the leaks that came out during the election don't even hint at right now I mean, this is just that's like the tiniest little sliver of the iceberg that the public's been offered right now yeah i mean what they also do is uh child sacrifices they kill children yeah. um they kill adults uh you know you step out of line you can't be controlled anymore you're killed Yeah, very interesting. I just was listening before we, we came online to uh, an anonymous uh, YouTube video that came out. And I don't know if you've seen this yet. It's actually posted on the Secret Space Pro Program group that you and I are a part of. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it goes into this whole Peter Gate thing and what it's about and some of what we're talking about. And then it goes into discussing how Stephen Greer has now been compromised and is basically the whole, this will go into another conversation, but the whole uh, UFO, ET disclosure, um, alternative media thing is now being just totally upended and ripped apart by, by the disclosures that are coming out. And that's, that's got a lot of loose ends to it that, you know, we can yeah, talk about as we go along. There's been a lot of name calling and mudslinging on various people. Um, and I just sit back and I'm like, okay, if people want to do that, whatever. Um, I try not to participate in that as much as I can because it's not good, good vibe for me. Um, and I did watch and acknowledge Stephen Greer's latest. It's certainly, you know, didn't really catch my eye. I didn't think much of it. It was it was a well done documentary, but it didn't give me anything new that I already didn't know about. No, there really hasn't been anything new. No, you know, this is this is most of what's been out there, as beginning with um, the X conference in two thousand and forward, has been slanted towards basically going back and rehashing. Oh my God. Roswell, Rendlesham, and all of these, what I call old school UFO memes that have been around for 50 to 70 years now. And we're still on this. I mean, I appreciate Paul Hellyer coming forward. And I appreciate that there are people who have, well, I don't know if I appreciate John Podesta or not, but we'll just for the you know sake of arguing here say, okay, John Podesta, Hillary Clinton, gave this lip service you yeah. know that's pushing it out there into the 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 awareness of the so-called general public i appreciate yeah. that but in terms of et disclosure i don't know what your policy is on this mine is i've said for years i've already had disclosure and most of the people i know in this realm have had have had their disclosure in spades yeah i've I've had exposure to it, and that's my disclosure, <laughs> basically. Right. Yeah. I've been exposed yeah. to them. So um, I've, had, I've had the whole gamut, the, the AT abductions, the AT contact experiences, the, the ICC abductions, and put, being put into their program. So it's like full circle. All of it has been done to me, and I, I've, I've, I've been exposed to all of it. So... I'm not really shocked or surprised by anything that's coming out in terms of pedogate about the secret space program. To me, it's like, oh yeah, I, 
I, I've I've seen this already. I've heard it all before. Another so day me, at the office. Yeah, exactly. It's not nothing new to me that I haven't experienced or gone through. Um, I don't I don't remember being sexually exploited in these programs. I I remember being taught how to be an assassin, um, to be trained to kill people. Didn't want to kill anybody, but the training was forced on me. So. Uh, and they use different vices for to to see what asset they can make you into. That's that's the thing. They they look at your personality. They look at all your abilities, what you're capable, how high you can be pushed, and they exploit that to the fullest degree that they can. Yeah, it's a. I don't know. I mean, my theory is that there is an element to that in all of this, just because of the programming. Whether you're actively used or not, I can't prove this. Just the number of people that I've talked to, my own experience is that there's, there's, there's an activation that occurs there mm -hmm. that involves obviously uh, a form of, of, of sexual initiation as well. Yes. You know? And yeah. if your memories are different than that, I completely understand that. I don't remember being sexually initiated. I okay. remember being initiated in the way of the warrior with with assassin training because they could initiate you that way as well. Okay. Um, let's just put it this way. If somebody tried to do something to me sexually in the wrong way, I'd just beat them up in black and blue and <laughs> they wouldn't know what happened to them because right. I won't take that. If, if, if somebody wants to assault me sexually, uh watch out you don't want to meet me in a dark alley at night because i'll just i'll just beat you black and blue <laughs> you attack me if i'm attacked or somebody tries to force something onto me that i don't want and it, it's violent or something i'll just beat them up and i won't think twice about it that's just the programming of what the icc gave me that's mm -hmm. how it was trained if you attack me i will respond back and I, I, I won't hold back. If somebody is violently attacking me, I will beat them up to protect myself. That's just, that's, that was part that's of your, my well, training. Well, that's, yeah, that's, your, that's your training. Yeah. Yes, that's how I was trained to respond to, to force and to brutality, to violence, to give back exactly what I get. And then some, that was the training. Let me pause here for one second. I need, I'm losing light in this room and I just, sure. my one light just went bananas on me and, and sure. dimmed out. Start the recording again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we took a lighting break there. Things are a little better. Mm -hmm. Where were we? Oh, we were talking about um, people didn't make moves on you because you, you could definitely take them out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what... I have some bleed through habits that uh, I developed when I was 23 to 25, where I just became interested in weapons, um, rifles, semi-automatics, handguns, uh, knives, uh, swords, battle axes. I, I just had natural training with it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went to t take my um, gu gun training test and for restricted and non-restricted, I passed with 89% and 96% in both. Um, and I didn't even read the booklet or watch any of the videos in how to use firearms because that's how you get the training. You just sit in a classroom mm -hmm. and you're taught all this information about guns and rifles, uh, handguns. So I, I just kind of like slept through it all. I just tuned it out and didn't <laughs> listen. And then just wrote the test, um, and then you had to pass the, the, the physical test of, um, of putting the, the gun together and taking it apart and loading the clip with mm -hmm. the ammo. So I just did that without any problem. I'm like, done. And he's like, oh, well, looks like you know what you're doing. You've already done this before. I'm like, no, I haven't. And then later on, I discovered, oh, wait, I did in the program training. Nice. So it was pretty funny. And I seem to notice that a lot of people who've been in the programs have motorcycles as well. Mm. That's, that, that, that's a little bit of a, of a trend going there, that people have had associations with motorcycles or own motorcycles. 
and uh, because they 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 were used to speed in the programs, zipping around and going mm-hmm. fast mm-hmm. on stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and it happened to me. I suddenly felt the urge to get a motorcycle, and I did. And I, I, I grabbed my father and I said, "You need to learn how to ride a motorcycle. Let's go past the gun training together." And my father is like, "Where is this coming from? This this child of mine was never interested in this, and suddenly, bam." She needs all of this stuff, and I dragged him into it. And now he's a happy camper, riding the motorcycle and using, <laughs> uh, going to target practice with with the weaponry. Mm. And I moved on to the healing stuff, and I'm like not so interested in the guns anymore. So, how long in your actual? chronological real world years do you believe you were involved with the projects 12 12 years 12 years um earth time 60 years space time and they can change that because Mm -hmm. when they use time traveling stuff to put you in and out of the programs they can make it like it was 60 years uh, my health is that of a 60-year-old, not a 32-year-old. My eyesight is very poor. Even the optometrist said, well, your vision has declined so much in the last two years, it's that of a 60-year-old, and I just smiled. I just mm-hmm. smiled because that wasn't any news to me. I've been reporting that I've been done the 60 and back, and my health is, is I have to prop my health, basically. I have to take supplements. Um, it's not that of a 32 year old, let's mm-hmm. just put it this way. Um, I have, um, it's weird. I have food allergies. I'm very sensitive to light, some neurological damage, some brain damage, and all of a sudden it all pops up. Mm-hmm. So it's, it wasn't a gradual thing, it's just boom. So that's another um, aspect of being in the programs. People can't explain why they're suffering for certain, from certain ailments or why they have these certain sensitivities to light, to food, whatnot. It's a common denominator mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of being out in space. Okay, so you mentioned your father there, and mm-hmm. I, I have to ask, uh, military background there as well? Your father? Yeah, he was in yeah. the army when he was 19 in the okay. Ukrainian army. Okay. That was a pretty tur- turbulent time in the Ukraine, too. So. Yeah, yeah. I was born in 1985, okay. um, and I left when I was six, and I spent two and a half years in Israel. Mm-hmm. That's another place that's active yes. in the programs. Yes, of course they are, yeah. So, and I saw some pretty weird stuff there like the religious stuff who pedophilia 24 7 yeah, yeah yeah definitely um uh yeah the parallels between that and the vatican are are, are pretty deep you know obviously um, yeah uh, um these these weird men who wear black trench coats and a huge top hat with the curly cue Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they, they go around to houses and apartments asking for donations for their place of worship. And if you don't open the door and donate, they'll piss into your flower pot, expose <laughs> themselves into piss into the flower pot. That's what happened to my mother and me because my mom didn't open the door. So they exposed themselves and pissed in the flower pot because we didn't yep. open the door to them. Yep. So... Yeah it's like there's no boundaries in the religious aspect of of these men and and, and you know if you're out and if you're a pretty young girl with blonde hair and you're out with your mother shopping in the kiosks you know how they have open uh, markets and kiosks mm-hmm, in israel mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. oh that's such a pretty young child blonde hair and they want to touch it and yeah the yeah just, they really prize that yeah. yeah you have such a beautiful child they'll make the comments openly and want to touch the hair and touch the child and my mom's like what the heck is this like we weren't used to that and so but apparently that's that's how that is in that country so you have to be careful when you're out and about with young children. And the reason why I ask you about your father's military background is that 
in my experience, they use access to military people as ways, again, to profile. Because obviously anybody that's in military has given over their own privacy. They have total access to records, medical records, family mm-hmm. records, all of that. Well, he was 19, so I wasn't even born okay. at that time. He was 19, and they had, my dad had me in his 20s, late 20s. Okay. So I wasn't even born when he was in the Army. And I, I was never in the Army, never in the Navy, in the military. So I have no military background at all. And that's kind of where I was going with this. I wanted to see if you had a sense that, because I, I actually am getting the sense that the military overlap. <laughs> Again, this is compartmentalization. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of my theories has been that part of the secret space program actually has nothing to do with space at all, that it is a weapons program that's been cloaked by both the front facing NASA type programs as well as these leaked programs of black budget space operations that have been going on obviously a lot of things have been leaked out even going back into the 1960s and forward that a lot of the leakage is the result of hiding 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 weapons programs and then on top of that there are all these other layers and levels of the stuff that Nobody's even going to believe if it is leaked because it all, it's, you know what, and you know this, it sounds incredible. It sounds like, it sounds like to the average person, it sounds incredible. Well, to me, it's not incredible. No, I understand that. I've seen it. It's yeah. like they could use energy weapons to, to shoot you in the brain and to cause you to have a brain bleed or to to cause you to start babbling and saying nonsense to make you look crazy because these energy weapons are directed at your, at your brain, at your body. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. suddenly develop weird fungus infections. You start spewing out black goo or something else because yeah. yeah. these energy weapons can just discombobulate your body and, and uh, create havoc with your system. And you don't see it is just an energy field with magnetic electronic energy coming at you emf fields so you you don't see it but you, you, it, it affects you anyway on the energy scale so, so they, some of the technology they have clearly is capable of altering time yes as we understand it and mm-hmm. that includes the ability to both do age progression and regression as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, what I've noticed about myself um, physically, the way I look now, I haven't changed since high school. I've looked this way since I was, I was gonna, 16. I was going to say you kind of don't look even 32 years old. Um, in these programs, what they used to do is give, give me drugs to make me look young so I wouldn't age. That's mm-hmm. something I have a clear memory of. And I've always been, I've always had the urge to take good care of myself. So I would always look young. Mm -hmm. I've always had that, that programming to maintain myself well, to, to look good. Mm -hmm. I don't wear makeup anymore. I don't put crap on my, on my, on myself anymore. Uh, I just have the urge to look young, to, to forever be young. So that's, that's, I think that's bleed through programming that's just continued in yeah, my life. Yeah, that sounds like it. It is actually. Mm-hmm. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the people in these programs don't look their age. Well, they're they not, don't. they're not, yeah, and they're not fed crap food. They're not, they're right. not given medicine that they're actually kept very healthy in the programs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to take care of, uh, Got to take care of the human assets, right? Yeah, when they return you back, they don't care about you. So they don't care if, if you're diseased or what after your experience in the programs. While you're in it, they take care of your health and you're in perfect working condition because you're, you're a live asset and they need you for stuff. But now that you mention it, it's interesting. Um, most of the people I know 
that have been in these projects have food allergies. They have both physical and emotional disabilities that aren't consistent with a normal life pattern. Uh, yes. A lot of internal damage, a lot of broken bones, a lot of things that don't add up to a life's experience yeah. inside the main, mainstream world. Yeah. I, um, I suddenly got brain damage I can't explain. I'm, I, I have a lesion in the white matter of the brain that I can't explain. I just suddenly got it. So, um, and I did, my neurologist didn't believe me. So I just went and privately paid for an MRI. And I said, here, look at this MRI. Like, why, why am I feeling this brain pressure and such sensitivity to the light that I can't sit under bright lights anymore? Mm -hmm. This is it. That's because I have, I have a lesion. I have scarring on my brain. Here's the proof. You want it? You want proof? Here it is. There you go. Um, you know, and I, I, I paid for it because I'm like, I don't, I, I know I'm feeling crappy and there's an explanation for it. And I actually took a course in a free radiology course online that I found on the internet, how to interpret your own MRI brain scans and how to order an MRI yeah. of your choosing. Because, yeah. hey, you're paying privately for it. So mm -hmm. you, you, you can requisition anything you want on your MRI based on your symptoms and get them to, to scan any part of your brain that you so desire. So I took the time, I took the free course, I studied it. Um, I said, I don't, I want to see if there's any tumors, blood clots, you know, any swelling, inflammation. Any lesions. chips? They find any chips by any chance? They, even if there are chips, they won't see it because they're neuralink yeah. fiber. They're small fiber, nanofiber mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your. Yeah, that technology's definitely advanced a lot. Yeah. That's what I had in my brain actually. And it's removed, but the scarring of it has remained. That's what the lesion is all about. And my doctors are like, how the heck did you know what you had? And I'm like, you know, I just studied it up and sort of ordered what I wanted for, for these tests. They know you kind of remote viewed yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah we all do that. Mm -hmm. um, Emily talks about that a lot. So she, she could tell us about, you know, scanning her body, remote viewing herself. And I, I guess I do it. It's, it's different, but I have a sense of what my body needs and when there's something wrong where something's located and I do this kind of energy thing where yeah. I have a sense. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. one of the one of the ways that we can kind of get ahead of things by doing mm -hmm. that because you know, you can begin to energetically heal. People the reason why people like medical technology is because it's quick fix. You take a pill, yeah. boom, you feel better, you get some surgery, boom, supposedly you're cured. Whereas you know, energetic, real holistic healing is, is time process sensitive and requires a discipline to it that's not part of normal uh, allopathic medical practices. Yeah. I mean, I take a lot of different supplements to make yeah. sure I'm running well and I'm, I'm on as, as best as I can be, as healthy as I can be. Um, and I don't sit under bright lights. I don't use the computer much. Um, I'm restricted to my computer use, to my webcam use, because all this stuff hurts my brain so much. So, and I don't watch TV. Like I try my, my best not to be hooked into the technology because it does, yeah. it does damage you. Yeah, it does. So it, it's just about knowing what's going on with you and understanding yourself and what happened to you. That's all yeah. it is. So you talked a little bit about weapons and motorcycles. Any other skills that have kind of popped out that are the result of what you believe to have been the training you rece received? Um, I'm good with computers and good with, I love technology. I love grabbing anything, figuring out how it works. I won't watch tutorials. I won't take courses. I just figure it out on my own. Yeah. Photoshop. Yeah. How does Photoshop work? I figured out Photoshop in two days. Yep. And I was editing photos. Um, I wanted to do radio. I wanted to do audio video. So I learned on my own in a month's time. Um, it had been a long time, 
like I was trained in school because it's, it's, I was trained audiovisual. Uh, I was trained customer service research, uh, library stuff. That's, that's my background library world. Um, so, but I, it had been 10 years designing a website. I didn't remember a thing, but I said, you know what? We're pretty good at it. Just, just, just start it. And, hundred pages in three months. My website has like a hundred and something pages. Now it's more than that. It's mushroomed out and I figured out how to keep it, you know, well balanced and in different categories and subjects. Um, just always naturally being able to use any technology, computers, software, or figure out yep. where to suggest how to use That's it. That's actually my story. I actually, when, compu the, when the computer revolution came in, I looked at computers and went, I completely understand this. And I know mm -hmm. why now, because they had them a long time ago. Yeah. And um, it was pretty good at it. I mean, I actually could make a living off of things for early computer days were good for me because I knew stuff that most people didn't even know they didn't know yet. So it was kind of like a real interesting period of time to be able to latch on to technology, but I like that too. And I mean, I take things apart and put things together and fix things and it, it all just makes sense to me. And yeah. that's, uh, and I don't read software manuals. I actually wrote software manuals at one point. I was actually doing training. Yeah. Um, reading technical uh, manuals. Yeah. Many people don't know how to use a photocopier. The manuals that are attached with it don't make zero sense so i wrote my own manuals for stuff yeah. for stuff like that to show people how to use it i took apart computers i took apart um old audio visual equipment um and fixed it overhead projectors i didn't know how to like i didn't know how to do any of that i just naturally screwdriver check all you need is a screwdriver and you can go go at it <laughs> figure out where the nuts exactly and bolts right. are get it yeah. out yeah take it apart look at it okay that looks fried that looks weak that you know test it test it to test the voltage to test, test the, voltage. the electricity yep get a get a voltmeter and just, yeah just yep. go for it get in there get into the nuts and bolts of it and see how it works and um i wasn't i was not afraid of setting something on fire i just went in for it and took it apart, looked at it, and, oh, yeah, that's easy. Uh, you know, it's a switch the diode, switch it up, switch the bulb, you know. Oh, this, this circuit is fried. Take that out, put a new circuit in. You know, the, 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 the wiring is screwed. You know, switch the wire out, switch the plug out, put it back in. You have a, a working overhead projector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's as simple as that, and it's dinosaur technology. Yeah, it is. It actually is. Solid state. Wow. Best technology the 1940s had to offer. Well, they still use overhead projectors in um, institutions. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, they do. And yet I remember a very advanced type of projector that I saw in the 1960s that was, it wasn't like anything like that. It wasn't an overhead projector. It wasn't a slide projector. It didn't use film. And in fact, yeah. I didn't see one for another 20 years. Yeah, and I, I'm all, I'm also good at researching and finding weird um, stuff on the internet, obscure mm. the most obscure stuff on the internet that um, doing just the, the legwork of the research because uh, I do sometimes my own uh, interviews and stuff, and I just find stuff that nobody else can find. I'm in famous for the images on my. Um, in all my various presentations and stuff and interviews, the cover titles mm -hmm. that I do, mm -hmm. they're not my images. I just find stuff on the internet that closely relates to what I'm talking about or describing. And I just put it as the cover titles for the shows and what I'm talking about as representation of what I experienced. People are like, but don't you know that was from a video game? Mass Effect or from something else? I'm like, yeah, well, video games are disclosure. Movies are disclosure. Yeah, video video games are big dis, big disclosure. Yeah, uh, they're actually a magnet for certain types of people like us because of the fact that they're drawn into something that they understand on an intuitive level mm -hmm. as a multi level world game. Yeah, which is effectively what we're talking about with all of this anyway. 
Yeah, well, actually, one of uh, the Dark Fleet contacts that uh, I experienced having a contact with, he introduced himself as, his name is Zagor. He said, I'm a reptilian insectoid hybrid. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Um, there's a likeness image of you in Mass Effect. And he's like, yeah, because that's disclosure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very so interesting. He, yeah. Um, so, you know, th- this sounds all crazy and weird, but it's just been a part of my life. Like, People say, you're, you're, get back on your medication. You're just crazy. None of this is real. You're just making it up. I wish I was making it up. What is real? What is my reality, your reality, and somebody else's? We, you know, that's, that's a whole thing that we talk about a lot is that basically this world quote the way it's laid out is designed to keep your vision narrowed yeah that was part of the design that was the reason why they gave you media why they gave you specifically television and then film i actually find music liberating when it gets beyond what is put onto radio yeah but the arts themselves are very expansive that when you conceive when you can conceive of something it becomes real that's that's one of my operating principles that was Same how i worked through a lot of trauma in memory recovery and in dealing with things that were as you probably know i mean when you, when you're going through re- recovering memory when you're coming to grips with coming out of something that has no component of reality in the so-called world, real world the only thing you can do is allow that to come in and then allow yourself to integrate that into your reality. And they would say that that's psychosis, but I think that, that begs the question, if you're able to integrate another reality and operate in reality, then you're not psychotic, you're no. not neurotic, you're not schizophrenic. No, no. Um, it's just most doctors don't understand what is going on beyond the normal no. spectrum of things in people's world. Um, you know, and, I, and people have asked me, well, have you gone to psychologists and shrinks and told any of them any of your story? I'm like, no. I would be labeled as a crazy and they'd give me antidepressant pills to, to gobble up. I'm like, I'm not going to. No, I don't fit into mainstream psychology or well, that should have get you locked up i mean you know yeah. that I don't. yeah i do no no i don't i don't want to <laughs> see a padded cell and stare at a blank white wall and uh, be wearing a straight jacket no thank you i learned or, real young not to talk about et's well i was always blabbing about et's um the thing that i remember is when i was three my dad had gone to France and he brought Power Rangers on video cassettes. He brought four video cassettes of the first season of Power Rangers. It was in French and he put it into the VCR and I, I was glued to the television watching Power Rangers in French. And I'm like, daddy, aliens are real. And my dad's like, just smiled and go, go watch Power Rangers. Even though it was in French, it was so enthralling and interesting. I couldn't stop watching it. In the back of my mind, I always knew aliens were real, Mm -hmm. that this was not made up, that this is real. So, and that's been like that throughout my life. Yeah, one of the great gifts for the the internet, and this was like early on, this was pre-web, was Usenet groups on the internet that where people could talk about some of this stuff. Yeah. This is like, I don't know, late 1980s, early 1990s. You would have still been a child then. Yeah. Um, but there were alt groups on using it. That's really where this whole alt thing comes from, was the alt dot groups that were on Usenet in the late 80s and early 90s. You would go in through a, uh, BBS, a portal, and then go into Unix to Unix networks, mm-hmm. and you could drop into all of these Usenet groups. And there was 
there was some very deep stuff going on there. Some of the people that emerged onto the internet, onto the web, that are out there now as even big figures in uh, ufology were on those boards back then talking about this stuff. But for me, it was like the first place I remember even being able to express these thoughts with other people online. It was like the internet allowed us to finally be able to talk about some of the stuff. Yeah. Um, I just opened my mouth and say, Hey, do you think aliens are real? Maybe possibly. And people get their eyes just become so big and I'm like, and I just smile. It's just sometimes I, I want to survey people and see what they think a true, raw, honest reaction. And people are like, so do you believe in aliens? I'm like, yeah, totally. I'm an alien. And people are like, well, you know, the it really, it, the, the disclosure started when we started to have the early films about it. Yes. You know, um, that was kind of the kind of opened the door. And then we had them before that we had like the space alien movies from the 1950s, which were cartoonish. Mm -hmm. They've always kind of been out there, but it was plausible deniability that we could just blow this off as imaginary, you know, that, that people read too much Ray Bradbury or Robert Heinlein or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, when we get to the place where we started to get the serious ET movies um, in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, um, then things started to get real. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg brought a lot of this stuff out. And, yeah. Um, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry. Barry as well. Yes, yeah, Star Trek actually helped bring that along too. Yeah, and Gene, Star Got, Gene Roddenberry was part of a group called The Nine. Yes. And, you know, Steven Spielberg and George, George Lucas were, were briefed on everything. A lot of what's woven into Star Trek, a lot of what's woven into um, the Star Wars movies, as you well know, yeah, are I watched in some it all. ways parallels of all this. They're uh, nicer, I, but yeah, yeah. I could I could name you off twenty different shows that do disclosure. Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Star Galactica. Yes, that's that's the one that I was thinking of too. I I, I didn't watch the old ones from the, the yeah the seventies yeah. when Lauren Green no. did yeah the, the yeah new I didn't series. watch that. I watched the new series with the Cylons. That's that's the organic uh, transhumanism. Yep. The yep. cyborgs, the AI, the robots, they, they were so real looking that they, they were part of humanity. Yes. <laughs> you can tell them apart from humans, except yeah. they're, they're, they're not born like us. They're, they come out of goop, mm -hmm. from this vat of goop and all. But you you'll, know, you'll all. find that in another movie. Yeah. That's over an alien with Sigourney Weaver that they put yeah. that. See, all of these details kind of dodge in and out of different film franchises and TV yeah. series. You yeah. know, and the people that have some sense of this kind of go, oh, yeah, that actually is correct. And there's other details as well because they can't dump it all out at once. So, I mean, we are getting that. We have been disclosed. We've been briefed. Yeah, and uh, like Prometheus and the show Passengers, yeah. mm. um, the medical pods in both of them. Yeah. Um, and there's this new show. I keep forgetting the name. It actually is, there's a war between Mars and Earth. It, it's, it's a new show. Yeah, I'm terrible with this. Um, yeah, The Expanse. There it is, The Expanse. Okay, I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, very good stuff. It actually discloses what the ICC could look like on um, on Mars and how the Earth elites, the government, is so corrupt. And it, it takes place 200 years in the future and talks about the belters and the mining and how they're being used, you know, for, you know, how they're all sick out there in the space mining stuff. And they don't get anything out of it. So do, you have a, do you have a sense? Do you have a sense of how old the, these programs actually are? I mean, how long they've been running these programs? 
I would say they've been the the ICC almost 80 years. Okay. That's longer than most people would would expect. My suspicions are that some of this may go back even into the 1800s. Oh, it does. Oh, it does go back into the 1800s. I was just telling a friend um, that the beginnings of these programs go back to the 1800s, the remote viewing, Mm -hmm. the Time Corp. The Time Corp goes back to the 1800s where they've been doing time traveling. And that's a separate program from the programs. Mm -hmm. If you... If you've ever watched um, the movie, the, the Assassin's Creed, the yeah. latest one that came out in 2016, okay. it, it, it shows time, it shows memory recall technology, how you can go back in time in your memories and look at stuff, look at world events, look at your own memory. So the time, I believe the Time Corporation program that is in charge of uh, the time traveling slipstream technology goes back to the 1800s. Yeah. I think some people theorize that it could be even tens of thousands of years old, given that they have the ability to go and reach in the time in the first place and how useful it might've been for them to be exploiting, you know, near ancient pasts in terms of, if you look at Egypt, or even if you want to go back to a, you know, the, what, what is called Lemuria and, and Atlantis, mm-hmm. that um, in all likelihood, this whole program has been part of, uh, it's been woven into human history for 100,000 years, probably. Yeah, I have a sense. past, yeah, I have a past life of, of Atlantis going back 2 million years ago. So in a so, sense, none of this is really actually new, but no, um, it does look like the the technology bled through. If you even if you look at the progression from the twentieth century, mm-hmm. and you look at the the two world wars we had, and how each one of those wars was a very quick acceleration of technology. How the beginning of the twentieth century, we barely had airplanes, and by World War II, we were fighting wars in the skies. Mm-hmm. And after World War II, we then had this whole military buildup that led us into the so-called space program. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for those who needed to have something to call it, so we we, we really kind of are talking about something that's very old and very ancient, and yet, yeah. you know, I, I think the sophistication now is actually in the business level. Yeah, these interlocking it is. corporations. And how they yeah, figured that is. out. Because yeah. do you do you know do you, you understand probably pretty much about law and how corporations work as an artificial entity and how they themselves actually are a form of AI. Yeah, of course, because they yeah. have their computer vaults, they have everything yep. is linked electronically, and you know, you have to have a certain clearance level to get access to anything. Mm-hmm. On the computers, on the servers, in the in the server room itself. God forbid if you go uh, trying to hack the servers of where you work, you'll be slapped. <laughs> Worse than like what what happened to yeah. McKinnon. He discovered the uh, yeah. Yeah. the uh, off world officers, non terrestrial officers, yep. in some kind of a fleet. And he was in the UK at the time and they wanted him in the US and they tried to extradite him, but they couldn't get him. And he's been quiet. This yeah, guy been just quiet, yeah. But uh, he he let something leak that was major that actually made it over top the wall in a sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly he well known in, in the alternative media, and it's even bled out someone into the mainstream, although I don't know many people who are partakers of mainstream media that know who McKinnon is and what he did. But um, the awareness level is that that's pretty high, high profile, what, what he discovered. And it gave other people, researchers, new places to look, mm-hmm. which kind of goes into an interesting place here, Elena, because without getting into dynamics and personalities and things like that, I want to get your take on a couple of things. Sure. Um, we come from the experiencer side, the, the, the side that is, 
like just the things we've talked about for well, we've been talking for almost 90 minutes now mm -hmm. are conversations that a lot of people would walk into and they would go, well, either somebody's been smoking something funny or somebody's mm -hmm. off their meds or somebody's read too many comic books. I mean, well, I can debunk all of that. Oh, I know you can. And then that, that, yeah. Feel a, free to do that. A, I don't smoke anything because weed doesn't agree with me. Um, I don't take any meds either. That doesn't agree with me. And I've never read comic books in my life. And I bet you're not making a boatload of money doing this either. I don't, I don't make zero out of this. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Zip. No. Zero. It's yeah. zero. Zero. Yeah. It actually costs you money. Yeah. Uh, that actually doesn't cost me a thing. Okay. That's good. Because the website, Messages from a Star Traveler, is hosted for free on Wix.com. Um, my YouTube channel is free. All mm -hmm. it did cost me was to get a webcam and this microphone so I could yep. do shows. But it costs you your time, and your time is valuable, too. So. Yeah. It well, does I don't cost you. I don't consider it as costing me. I consider it as being part of disclosure and doing mm. my service work Yep. about what happened to me and uh, to bring some awareness to all of this crazy thing that's going on. So we're on one side of this world here that's investigating all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there that are doing research yeah. who are what I call hard documentarians, people who amass evidence, write books, mm -hmm. look into historical records, attempt to... Rich Dolan is a good example, Joseph Farrell. Yeah. Um, they're, they're solid researchers, the people that are documentarians. And they're all kind of on the other side of this thing. And mm -hmm. one of the conversations that Emily and I have been having, and we've had it with other people, has a lot to do with all of the uproar that's going on inside of the UFO community, the exopolitics communities, and the secret space program communities, which obviously goes into the whole brouhaha over certain well-known personalities. Yeah. Is that on the one hand, the experiencers have basically said, look, this is what I know. This is what I remember. I'm giving you my experiences. I'm merging it with a, a pool of knowledge of other people who have similar experiences. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of agreement that this is going on. There's literally probably thousands of people on the internet talking about various aspects of the SSP. Yeah. The documentarian people for the most part have said, we want proof, we demand proof, and we will take nothing less than proof. So, in effect, what's happened is we've kind of ghettoized the experiencers at the expense of losing valuable venues to data. Tell me how you feel about that. Tell me what you think about that and how that's impacting what you're trying to do in terms of your own disclosure process. Well, people have contacted me with their SSP experiences. So I say, okay, let's chat about it. I mm -hmm. want to record it on video and audio to have mm -hmm. it as a record privately. It won't be posted anywhere. It'll never be leaked for other media sources and alternative media or anywhere. But I want to have a record of your story. Um, tell me as clearly as you can what you remember in the sequence of how you remember it. That's how I go about seeing what, what the people's experience is how much memory they have uh, for me as the more you can provide me with the better for me to, to see, to correlate any points of whether you're having bleed through memories of what this is that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. I want to see, I want to hear the story. I want to hear the story of the person. That's, that's the number one thing I look at. Um, then I do ask, you know, where did you work? You know, what's your experience? Cause sometimes uh, where you work and the knowledge you have directly correlates with your SSP or other programs. That's exactly experience. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, hobbies, interests that all also correlates with training. So that's what I look at from the experiencer side of this. 
Who is the person? Where do they come from? What happened to them? What do they know? What's your knowledge base? What's your skill set? What are your hobbies? Um, and, I, and I put all of that together. That's how I research it for my shows or for anybody I talk to. I wanna, that's what I want to know. From the researcher's point of view, okay, well, provide evidence for me. How am I supposed to provide evidence of bases, photos of bases? Yeah. What, they're going to let me sneak yeah. in a camera to take that, pictures? You're saying the exact same thing that, that I've said and other people have said as well. Yeah. Oh, and the ET is going to let me take a picture of it when I'm in another dimension or on another planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how's that going to work? Yeah. They have, they have ways of masking video. If, if these UFOs don't want to be seen in our Earth space, they'll just blink, they'll just put their shield on and you can't take a photo of them. They're invisible now. Or even worse, you can be standing there looking at one that you see and nobody else can see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've been lucky enough that I've seen the triangles hovering above my head about my house and I've snapped yeah, you pictures said, of yeah, it. Yeah, you sent me that, you sent me that image. That, let's yeah. talk about that, the oh, triangle UFOs. Yeah, I've been seeing those since November 2016. Uh, and, I, I've, and I, I've been more aware of them. Um, so I, I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna try to take a picture of this. And um, I was creeping around at 1 a.m. taking walks at night in the forest. People said, that's probably dangerous. Like, are, are, aren't you afraid? I'm like, no, I'm not afraid at all. And because these <laughs> things are only out at night between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. That's yeah. when they usually hover above my house or near the forest. So I go for, I, I go for the walk at 1 a.m. And, and almost at 2 a.m. I start seeing it. And I'm like, get my camera. Time to snap a pic. I'm like, hold still. I tell them telepathically, hold yeah. still. I need a good picture of you, please. If somebody wants evidence, here's the evidence. They're, they're floating above my house. They're monitoring me. What else do you want? That's all I can give. I can give photos of triangles. Yeah. We'll throw that, we'll throw that photo into this, this when, we, when we put this out. Because I, I really wanted to thank you for sending that to me. Um, because that's extraordinary to get those. Um, but we, we have a friend down in New Orleans, Sean Goutreau, who's done incredible work with photography and videos, who's isolating cloak craft inside of clouds and uh, mm -hmm. stratospheric apparitions and all kinds of weird structures and shit going on. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's probably the most ignored person in ufology with any you if you want this if you want solid evidence there it is it's in mm -hmm. front of you you know yeah God, i can't give you a picture of the landscape of mars sorry they, they didn't hand out polaroids for that but but i can it, mark off the locations on google mars <laughs> and i've done it i've put out the 11 bases that i've seen that where i was on mars you know anybody can go and have a look the only thing I don't like is my name being on the internet. I, I have taken off from all interviews, Alina Kapolman. I just go by Eliana now because I don't want emails coming to me asking for healing services or psychic readings. People just see my name and they want services. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm like, so in this, can you take out my name, Alina Kapolman, from your interview title? If you can. Yeah, it will never be there. If that's what you want it, then yeah. it will be whatever you tell me you want it to be. We didn't actually introduce you. You introduced yeah. yourself yeah. for that reason. So I, I, I'm like, before I had my name out, I don't care if people listen to me or not. I, don't, I really don't care. I don't care. I don't want to be world famous. I don't want to be on Gaia TV. I don't want to be on radio shows. That's not, that's not why I do any of it. So... You know, I'm obscure and anonymous, and that's fine with me. As long as the info is out there, it's disclosure. Yeah. I, I'm not looking for the limelight. Yeah. But you've kind of, do you want to talk about this? Do you want to talk about the, how you've been treated by certain people? Um, yeah, actually, I've, I've, been, um, I've been getting uh, some, 
I did an interview yesterday where I talked about my experience with Corey Good and the email mm. exchanges. And today it's like, I got in a few PMs like, you know, why are you talking about this again? There's no need. There's no need for you to, to rehash old history. Um, and my response to that would be, well, why, why can't I talk about it? I'm not going to, I'm not going to call people bad names and I'm not going to speculate on anything of what I've seen being done to certain individuals. Like, you know, with saying this is a cult following or this is that, I'm not going to do any of that because. Well, I kind of did that. So just, just so you know, up front, I, I said that. That was, that was kind of me doing a media analysis thing, but that's not you. No, that's not me. I just, I did a show yesterday where I talked about the email exchanges I had with Corey Good in mm -hmm. 2016, September 3rd. And people are like, you know, I'm sorry that you're doing this. You don't need to. I know I don't need to, um, and I'm not going to be popular for it, but why shouldn't I talk about the experience? It's like, it happens, you know, there wasn't anything horrible in it. I just got called out as a fake and a liar because of stuff that I've shared. Um, I don't, I don't agree with it. I know I'm not a fake and I'm not a liar. Um, I'm not going to publicly put these emails out on the open on the internet because I don't, I don't want any backlash for, for that either. I don't want lawsuits because mm -hmm. I know you can be sued in breach of privacy and email exchange if you make it public, but I can talk about it. So basically, um, you know, I shared some, had some email exchanges where I asked, do you know about certain Mars bases? Didn't respond to that. The, the person did uh, say, what's your name? Who are you? My name, I sent them my name and some info about myself. Next thing I know, I'm being vetted and told that I was never in the SSB or the ICC. And being asked about my ET experiences with the Blue Avians, the descendants of the ancient builder race, they're the L, um, you know, and being told, you know, you haven't had any ET experiences recently. You only had it as a kid up until 1990s well that's information that i've publicly posted so that's nothing new to me mm -hmm. hearing that in the email response that's as far as it went that's the gist of the emails with the individual that we know so i, I guess the, the question becomes who gets to be the arbiter of what is legit who gets to judge that and I'm not comfortable with this. And, and, you know, I'm trying to keep this out of because of things that I've said and because of things that have been cross fired across the internet infinitely mm -hmm. and how even my own communications have been exploited by mm -hmm. high visibility media figures for their own purposes. Yeah. When in fact, the only thing that I ever did was I wrote a Facebook post. That Facebook yeah. post wound up going viral. And as a result of that, I wound up in the center of a pretty big controversy that I didn't really plan. It's like the old Billy Joel song, We Didn't Light the Fire. Well, I, all I was doing was putting out an opinion. But yeah, since but, we went down this road now, yeah. the question becomes this. It's very clear that what's happened over the last, since April, when that post went out, and contact in the desert, and then where we are today, it's June, my God, it's June 29th already, wow. Mm -hmm. um, so we're two months down the road here. Yeah, It is like ufology, uh, disclosure movement, exopolitics is in this civil war right now. What and civil war? It's, it's, like the, it's like somebody wants to control the narrative. And yeah. what I don't understand is nobody controls the narrative. It's a conversation. No. Yeah, it is a conversation. Whether it was an email exchange or phone call, whatnot, it's a conversation. Yeah. In this day and age, we do have the ability to record the conversation, yeah. video, audio, email exchange, and uh, freely share it. But the thing is, these people who've been saying we have this and this, they haven't shared any of it. So for me, you can't back it up with nothing. It's just lip flapping. 
Yeah. You're flapping your lips. Uh, do your research about people. The way I interpret it now is if there's whistleblowers or somebody, an insider, I look at the person and I look at the information that they're putting yeah. out. I look at both these days. That's what I've learned to do from my Corey Good email exchanges. Um, the information is sensational. The person is sensational. And, you know, that person has a huge following. Corey Good has a huge following. And that's fine. I don't, I don't care. Whatever. Have your fans, have your following, do whatever you're doing. Just, just be a little bit nicer to people. Um, I didn't appreciate being called a liar and a fake. Um, and I, I certainly don't know why he put himself out as the authority figure to vet people. Maybe he's, you know, that's, the the program he's in probably said, hey, you can do this. Go do it. And he's doing it. It's not the program that he came out with, though, is it? Because the program that he came out with was the the Blue Avian revelations, which said that this would not have a leader. It would mm -hmm. not be a cult. And that it was all about forgiveness of self and forgiveness of others. And let's define the word forgiveness for a minute because it's not, Oh, you screwed up and now I need to grant you sanction or forgiveness. Forgiveness is cutting somebody slack on a human level, which means you come to me as we've done in this, in this talk mm -hmm. with your story, your narrative, and you're completely open and candid and, yeah, uh, you know, my interactions with you have been so pure that I look at the conversation and, and, and I just accept this for who you are and for what you're putting out. And I would like to be able to do that with everybody that comes forward. So the standard then becomes what is the person really like? Mm -hmm. So when I see the level of, I, I, I've, I've been attacked savagely by people in the Corey Good camp who have said that I am divisive. I'm a troublemaker. I'm trying to make a name for myself. And I'm going, um, no, actually, what I'm doing here is I'm assessing the character of the person and the message of the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's how I got to know Corey Good through the emails. I got to know the person of who he is and what his belief systems are and what his encounters and experiences are. I got to know that through digital email exchange. Never spoken on the phone with him, but he, I know he firmly believes everything that's happened to him. That is this, this is his reality. He's living this and that's his story and that's fine for him. I just didn't choose to believe what he was telling me. Yeah, that's kind of where we came away from it, too. You know, having gone back, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> allergies big time here. So I'm, I'm kind of, um, I actually go back to Corey's emergence on Project Avalon back in 2013. Mm -hmm. no, I did not participate. I was not part of the groups. I was on Avalon. I saw the posts and I followed the history from afar. And so I'm somewhat familiar with it. And I'm also somewhat sympathetic with somebody who puts themselves on the line to advance a narrative. Because I mm -hmm. think in the beginning it was, was genuine. Yeah. And this is what Christina and Anderson and I talked about as well. I'm not here to judge that. But I'm horrified. I'm horrified at the state of this alternative internet fishbowl that we're in to the point where over the last couple of months, quite honestly, I felt like just packing it in. I've been doing shows on this kind of material since 2007, almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I've watched it get by progression, more petty, more divisive, more sensational. Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed people from all walks of lives who have had a va variety of experiences. Some of those people were well known. Some of them were complete unknown. Some of the recordings never were aired. Mm -hmm. 
I still have them sitting on my hard drive because my rule was like yours. I want to hear your story. Now, we yeah. didn't do videos in the early days, but voice is a pretty good way to convey the energetic profile of a person. Yeah, for sure. So I now look at the aggregate of all this, and I'm like, this is what it's come down to, bidding rights for TV shows, and who's the most sensational so that we can sell commercials on the History Channel and subscriptions yeah. to Gaia TV. Yeah. It's, it's, it's paid. Um, yeah. If it's free information that's flowing on the YouTube channel, then people are more apt to, 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 to have a listen because it's free. Like there's, there's no agenda or motive behind it to make money. Um, yet people have to earn a living and, f and feed themselves and their mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. And if yes. that's the only way you could feed yourself, that's how you do it. That's right. That's right. So, um, yeah. I don't want to be feeding myself that way through, through, through the money paid aspect of disclosure work. I, that's, mm -hmm. I just energetically don't want to do that. And people are saying you have an obsession with Corey Good. You can't let go of what happened last year. I'm over that. That's not why I'm talking about it. It's just interesting to me. Why did this person do that? What was, what was behind it? It's just interesting to me. So why can't I discuss that? Well, it's funny because it's a current conversation. It's still going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, a, there was an article that came across a couple of days ago into some of the groups talking about Corey's recent article on fake uh, secret space program whistleblowers, I guess, I, whatever the term was. I, I don't have the article in front of me. That was last year. Was that last year's article? Okay. Yeah, somebody asked me about it and I reposted and they're like, why are you incriminating, incriminating yourself reposting? I'm like, I don't care what this guy thinks of me or what he okay. posts about me. So that was last um, year's then. Okay, that's yeah, interesting. But it popped up again because I reposted it. Somebody asked me okay. something about yep. it and I said, here, have a read at it. You, know, you want to know what went down? Go read it. I'm not going to write a, a monologue about what what was written about me and what was written in that article per se because i had i i read the thing i'm like okay well you know it was posted whatever who cares it's just this this phenomenon keeps on popping up over and over again and i swear this is not an obsession for me with Corey good couldn't care less whatever yeah well but you get accused of that largely because all they basically want you to do is shut up and forget it ever happened. But the conversation yeah. from two, last year is as more relevant now probably than it was last year because it's all been amplified. Yeah. It's this whole media thing, and I wish I wasn't contributing to it because the whole media thing is like a gigantic echo chamber yeah. where everything reverts and bounces off and there's feedback and then there's, there's loops and so yeah. we're all caught in this thing. And I keep, I actually, as a result of a conversation I had with Og Telez yesterday, I sort of resolved that I was going to begin to back out of this energetically. I was just going to mm -hmm. withdraw from it as much as possible because yeah. it's very toxic. It you is know, toxic. Yeah, it is very toxic. But Corey Good has become a, a phenomenon and people yeah. just want to figure out, okay, who is Corey Good? What is the information he's putting out? Why is he doing this? What's behind the man? Who is the man? What's behind him? Yep. What motivates him? What drives him to do all of this stuff? Like people want to know because he's he's become like Superman in a way. He put himself <laughs> out there to become he did. Superman. He did. He's in the he's a public figure. He's in the public domain he's on yep. facebook on twitter on youtube uh everywhere he's everywhere right now so people yep. want to know what this what all of this is he's in ufology he's in um uh, sci-fi he's in books he's in in video audio comic books uh backpacks whatnot he's in all of it so <laughs> yes, you know it's is. just Oh, just we, we just want to know what is this and what is this phenomenon is it truly disclosure or is it a narrative what is this it's just it's just people want to talk about it and figure it out that's all this is 
-hmm. It's not an obsession with Corey Good. No. I don't spend my days wanting to go blab on shows about Corey Good. Like I don't have anything else to do. No, and actually, in all fairness, I kind of debated in the back of my head if we were going to go there. I, before we went on air, it came up again. So I thought, okay, you kind of signaled me it's okay, but it wasn't what I wanted this to be about. I um, didn't want to talk about it either, but it seems to be popping out. and It's, it's like, not, it, it is like, I guess we just have to do this. Uh, you have actually been one of the most balanced people I've talked to about this. I, I sense in your heart how you feel about this, and it, it's painful. I mean, I don't know what people think. I like you. I'm not sitting around looking to take pot shots at people in general. I would really like to get on with the business that I think we're about, which yeah. is to get to the truth of this. And yeah. I'll say this because we we brought it up earlier. You know, the hard researchers out there need us and we need them mm -hmm. and there are researchers out there who reject the experiencers i think to their own hurt because they're not willing to sit down and have a conversation which could lead them to begin to look at some things there are clues yes you know when you talk mm -hmm. about the technology all of that technology has a footprint Yes. You know, and the footprint is wide in history, but it's also been covered over. Because yeah. not only do they change times, they're changing history on the fly too. And they're rewriting it faster and faster now. Yeah, we're we're actually the living technology because we yes. have the memory of all of this. Exactly. Yeah. We have the memory footprint yeah. of it all. It's stored in cellular memory, and there's even studies about all of that. Yes. So we have this meat suit that, that has memory. We have the soul that has memory and it works in tandem together to just try to figure it all out on this planet yeah. that we're living on. So, you know, um, and I really, like I said, I don't care what people think about me. I, I'll discuss what I want to discuss freely and openly because why, why should I yeah. have to shut up? Uh, other people have done rebuttals. They've openly talked about, you know, this person said this about me. Well, that's not how it is. Why should I have to just shut up and take it? I know I can take the higher moral route, and I will. I won't mudsling. But I, if I want to dis discuss my experience with so-and-so, why shouldn't I? Yeah. Yep. I think we'll leave it there. I think we made a pretty good statement that yeah. listeners and viewers can examine for themselves. Exactly. Um, um, oh, I had a question for you. Yeah. Well, wh why did you write what you wrote about the cult? And, and, you know, why did you write that? What were your feelings about it? My feelings were what I saw when I looked at the videos that he was doing. And this, the, the specific term there was cult of personality. Mm -hmm. It has now morphed into a wider expansive meaning of the cult, but that's what I saw. And okay. I saw it from an ego level. That was my read. I had not looked at Corey Good's material. I don't think I've spoken about Corey Good or written about Corey Good since he emerged. This is nobody can accuse me of that. I I my my footprints out there, my Facebook page, my website. This is not something other than the fact that Emily Moyer, my, my producer and co-host, sent me the Contact in the Desert poster of Corey Good and said, what do you mm -hmm. think of this? And so I went out, I, I looked at Corey's website, I looked at his Facebook page, and I looked at some videos. When I saw the CGI material, and when I saw where this was going, even in terms of how Corey was doing um, his, his video blogs, and how he was basically attaching his own personality to the wider message. Mm -hmm. And then the ego transference that I was sensing and all of that, plus the fact that I did know the background. I did know the history of what happened between 2013 and 2014, both on Avalon and on, on other boards that were out there. Mm -hmm. And 
actually Shane the Ruiner had talked about this on our show mm, probably last October. Shane had brought it up. He wanted to talk about this. And so that was it. That, that got mentioned in that show. We left it go. But when I saw this, I, I have to say I was kind of shocked at what I saw in terms of what I understand because of my background, the evolution of a cult and how they work mm -hmm. and how they begin to build a, a gravitational center around a central figure and a central set of core tenets mm -hmm. is how you build spiritual, religious cults of personality. And, and there are articles on my website that explain what this is. We've talked about it in terms of people like Simon Parks. I've talked about it in terms of Kesh, Stephen Greer, to a, to a lesser degree, how we're attaching personalities of these people to the larger message, to the point where the message gets obscured and the personality then overshadows it. Yeah. So that is what I meant when I, when I said, I wrote that, I said that, I did say that. That was my lead off to this whole thing. My opinion, my thoughts, and I, I tried to back it up with you know as much rational and reasoning as I could. Now, I don't know anything about you. First time we've like, right, talked. Exactly, what, you don't. What is your background? That's complicated. Um, UFOs since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. That's probably the core thing right now. And some of it, it kind of bleeds out from there. Um, tested in what was probably like talent back when I was in elementary school. And then, you know, I have some other memories of things where I was in training and where I had some actual experiences with what I would call a, a basis type environment. And that's, that's all I really have at this point. Not a lot beyond that. So like basis, like actual military bases mm -hmm. or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Earth very similar or? to, for, I suspect psychic training. Okay. Was it and, on Earth or Mars yeah, or yeah, where? Yeah, well, nearly as I can tell, it's all terrestrial, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I like I said, I don't know anything about you, so asking you these questions is pretty cool. Because <laughs> it's an open me, discussion. Yeah, it is an open discussion, yeah. Yeah. Their questions. And, what, yep. and what's your work background? Because you're technology. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Same for me. I'm Various types technology. of technology. And, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm mostly computers, audio, mm. video. Yeah. That's just what I learned in school. And that's what I did at work. I actually fixed stuff, computers, yep. audio, video. Um, um, and it's just, I believe people when, when what they tell me at face value, what they say about themselves, I try to be open-minded. I'm a bit mm -hmm. more cautious now than I used to be before. So I'm not, I'm not so raw and green anymore, but uh, you know, life stories are important and interesting to talk to the person and figure yeah. out who they yeah. are, not just the information they're giving out these days. At least that's the lesson I've learned. Hard lesson. I, mean, I think it, was a lot easier for me to be able to approach this, I won't say as a journalist, mm. as a researcher and as somebody who is curious about things. It was really, t you know, and I've said this openly for years that doing this was, I never planned any of this. Mm -hmm. I was actually on Christian radio and I kind of moved out of that. I kind of, I went through kind of a spiritual change. And so as I was transitioning, I was looking at this other stuff and some of the stuff has always been things I was interested in. And all of it sits in the background of a larger experience. So mm -hmm. as this show evolved, it found its own center because I began the, it is, I remember in 2007, no, 2009, a friend of mine said, yeah, I saw your new UFO show. And I said, it's not a UFO show. And he said, well, it's called Off Planet. And I said, well, that's actually 
anchored more in a concept that I had of pirate radio, which was a thing back in the 70s, uh, largely in the UK, with Radio Caroline and these, these boats that sat offshore that broadcast radio. And I just took the metaphor and extended it. Wouldn't it be cool to do that off-world? So yeah. it was originally off-world radio. I couldn't get the domain for that, so it became off-planet radio. But it never was a UFO show, but it, that, that's a component to it. The other component to it was delving into mind control and black projects. And each step of the way was kind of not only research, but it was, it was me looking for me in the midst of all that. And I found voices and I found people who brought stories to the table that amplified things in a way that made sense and made it more comfortable to talk about things that quite honestly, I didn't have a language for. So a lot of this was self-discovery and a lot of it still is. And I sense that it's probably the same for you. You, you seem to have a much better set of memories than many people do. Um, more complete. I like to remember everything vividly and as much to the point as I can. It's part of, it's part of the research training. Like in school, I was taught to dig, dig, dig for the information until I get it, until I find it. Hmm. And um, we were taught to, to, to set up simulations and experiments and to have validation behind the experiment. You know, mm -hmm. if we were doing a business project, set it up, set up the business project as if it's alive, as yeah, if it's, yeah, you yeah. know, it's in progress, it's being done, and then validate the uh, the results of the finished work of that experiment, business project, whatnot. Uh, because I had psychology, I took psychology courses, I took library courses, I took uh, business management, I took mm -hmm. supervisory courses. And in all of that stuff, you had to back up your research with valid information that was clearly stated in all the reports and projects. So whatever you did, you had to simulate it actually as if it was happening, as if you were creating that thing that you were writing your report about. That's how the library world works. You have to have real-time data to back up your stuff. So, and to dig, dig, dig deep and have multiple sources to back up whatever you're doing and make sure they're legit and credible. So, and it's interesting you would bring that up in the context of what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Because one of the, you know, one of the, I, I don't want to say accusations, but it actually is, is that these people were just telling stories. They're just making, making things up where they have overacted back to all of the circuitous arguments about why this isn't real. It's not real because you can't produce document, and but you just you just brought brought us back full circle again, because the act of what we're doing, which is confirmational, which is you've interviewed people, I've interviewed people. Yeah, we've had the ability to cross correlate data across multiple sources. Yes, and historians, you know, historians, which I know Rich Dolan knows this. Historians are still relying on documents that were made by a human being who theoretically was a witness to something. Yes. Or maybe in some cases you have Stella or you have glyphs or you have some sort of writing in caves or you have scrolls or something. But all mm -hmm. of that's been transmitted by humans who were witnesses and experiences at the time. Yes. Including, by the way, documents that come out of FOIA requests and archives and things like that. They've all well, passed through human hands and we all know how well that's been containerized by the boys at the company. Well, I've worked for archives. I've, I've handled, you know, just library documentation, pictures, <clears throat> information about universities, stuff like that. And that's incredible sources of information. Yep. And FOIA is like, it, it's just basically gathering information. What is FOIA? Can you say the full name of it freedom of information act there you go freedom of information act and in, in some countries it's it's a little bit more it's got other, yeah every country in the west yes. 
has some mechanism for citizens theoretically to be able to access documents that are on some level of declassification, and that's important yes. to remember as well. Yeah, and um, you know, there's rules and laws of it, a Freedom of Information Act. It, it might not be the same in every country. To a degree, it's different, right? And how it's run. Yeah, and well, some of this is public, public documents that corporations have to make public for the purpose of their shareholders and investors. Yes. So we need not forget that government is a corporation. So it is. Um, there's certain proprietary information that they they will release, and there's certain proprietary information they're under no obligation to release because of trade secrets. Mm -hmm. When we talk about classification under the National Security Act, that was effectively a classification system for a, a corporatized government, mm -hmm. as Rich Dolan himself. Yes, has, has written about. Yeah, he has. And it's interesting. You have a uh, you have a background in library science. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Background is in uh, actually document management and retrieval. Yes. Largely in electronic retrieval systems, and part of my background is that in the nineties I was I was I was marketing, and I was a sales engineer for Minolta Corporation marketing hybrid systems to scan both printed bound materials and microfilm and microfiche as well. Oh. So we were doing, so we were doing consulting on a whole bunch of levels for companies who were scurrying then to bring their mat archived materials into the digital domain because of what was coming under the digital uh, yeah. millennium acts that would be enacted by the Clinton administration, which were requirements that these agencies and public organizations bring their materials forward into the digital domain. Yeah, and uh, I actually worked with Minolta readers, showed people how to use them. And it's mm -hmm. so, so glad we have yeah, yeah. scanners and computers now because those things are hard to, to use. They're not Very hard friendly. to use, yeah. It was, but it was the best technology that they would allow us to have at the time to be able to to scan that, that type of material. And they could print too. Those Minolta mm -hmm. readers could print and they'd always have paper jams in the tray mm -hmm. at the bottom. It's like, oh. It's not a company that was particularly good at making printers, no. Oh, and, and changing the toner, you'd literally have yeah. uh, powder <laughs> in your face. You'd have to wear the bib yeah. and the apron just to change well, the toner. Ultimately, it took them down. Ultimately, Minolta got bought out by Konica. Yes. Uh, which I, interestingly enough, I went on to work for Konica for a short period of time too. So like that. But um, the point of all that is to say that um, the flow of information is, is limited, but we're very aware of it. Yes. We're aware of how good it would be to have all this documentation. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that you're dealing with corporations and agencies whose documents are not ever in the print domain. No, they're in the server they're domain. They're top never secret there classified. to begin with. Yeah. No, they're they're on servers as pieces of little digital data in zeros and ones and twos, and all yep. it's encrypted. Um, FOPA is about asking the right questions to get the right information because if yeah. your request is vague you're going to get a vague answer if your request is very detailed and I want this this and that very specific you might get it or you might get an interesting response back saying it's classified and you don't have any access to it or you get nine yards of black magic marker on large reams of paper yeah, which is what a lot of people get. And then you, you go through them and you hope that you can glean some context from documents that were clearly bleached, which yeah. is what this is mostly about anyway. Yeah, it's all, uh, or it's, it's, it's so double scanned over and over, you can't read what the yeah, heck you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The William Tompkins book that's out there, um, you know, I, that's a separate issue, but there's some of the documents that were presented there were let's just say they've suffered the ravages of time and they 
don't necessarily, in my opinion, have documentary quality in terms of being processed in a way that there's, here's the other thing. It's called chain of evidence. Documents need to have that. This is, I learned this working with law firms of how they use documents to establish chain of evidence, something that's very mm -hmm. important if you're going to present a court case and mm -hmm. use document documentation as evidentiary material. So then same we in the medical this, field. Same in the medical field, exactly. That was another another field that, that I interfaced with. So we have problems in terms of documentation, but we don't have problems in terms of corroborative evidence. Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe a good place to leave this for us, Elena, is just this is why the community itself needs to find ways to deal with this, to deal with the pettiness and the bickering and the infighting, and also with the over wrought heavy handed management and handling by media figures to people who are coming out to make disclosures. Um, what I don't, what I find inconsistent, there's no consistent protocols. No. The researchers have their own protocols. Um, but how do you, how do you vet these people that are coming out as SSP insiders or, or ET contactees? How do you vet these people? Like, well, what's the standard protocol for this? Because there's not a protocol that's really standard. There's not. Like, what, what would be your protocol for this if you were investigating somebody, hypothetically speaking? How would you do it? Say the I only came way to... We, the only way we can do it right now is one-on-one, -on -one, sit down and talk and tell me about your experiences. Mm -hmm. Put it on the record because there's somebody else out there that possibly has corroborative overlap evidence, and we've seen that repeatedly. Where people uh, which, drop details mm -hmm. in the narratives. And the details yeah. are tells for a wider story. Do I have a means to do this that's... No, I don't. Mm -hmm. No. In all these years, the only thing I've ever asked people to do is just tell me their story. Mm -hmm. But would you ask for any physical proof of evidence? Like, what would be... Okay, what would be acceptable proof of evidence that you can get to prove what you're talking about? Like, if, if you're being constantly abducted. Um, well, you'd be looking for scoop marks. You'd be looking for implants. You would be looking for signs of invasive medical procedures. Mm -hmm. um, radiation burns even psychological profiling in this case, because there's a fair amount of trauma and there's a fair amount of um, disassociation that goes on with, those, with these things. Missing time, uh, scrambled memories, memories that contain enormous amounts of data but don't have a context. Mm. Recently, what I discovered is if you're constantly abducted by the programs or even the ETs, sometimes there's hovering ships right over your house mm -hmm. from two to four. And if you can take a picture, that's, that's at least you have something on record. Uh, and I've been taking pictures for the last half year and all I get is triangles of varying shapes, sizes, and colors. I get triangles which is common, I think it's TR3B or something else. That's, that's what it's labeled as. Um, but even that's hard to figure out, well, you have a picture, you could you know, manipulate it any way, shape, or form that you want. I haven't manipulated any of what I've had. I've changed color slightly to see it better. Changed, I don't have infrared on my camera, so I had to adjust it just to see what the heck what the mm -hmm. heck my camera took, and I don't even have a good camera. I don't have a Coolpix 900P. Right, I have right. an older style model, Nikon um, 7100, D7100. And okay. I have to struggle just to zoom in on something. Yeah, it's yeah. 85 millimeters. So it's not like I'm going out there uh, taking awesomely beautiful pictures of the sky. I, 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 I'll take what I can get. 
basically what what I have and that's enough for me you know there's something out there in the sky that's continually hovering and it's not going away so for me I consider that proof it's something maybe you know the first person you have to prove something to is yourself yeah you know, ultimately the resonance pattern of truth is kind of something that intuitively we read and i've stopped looking for taking apart details um you'll notice we went through this interview it's kind of scattershot it's not linear no. it's sort of off the cuff and flowing yeah. because i don't think that approach really works and as i'm talking to somebody you and i have just gotten to know each other in front of cameras here and as yeah. we've gone along we've sort of acclimated to each other's energy fields to a certain level comfort levels have gone up trust level begins to kick in yes communication begins yes and to me that's that's the human process of doing this because i'm you're not trying to sell me a story i'm not trying to sell you a story and we're not trying to sell anybody who watches or hears this a story no we're exchanging information for the purposes of I look at it this way. The one perk that I've gotten from doing this for so long is I have a good network of people. I've gotten to meet some amazing people, people that I'm just immensely blessed to have met and spoken with and known. Mm -hmm. And if that was all I got out of this, it would be worthwhile. But I got something yeah. more, you know, you, you learn things about yourself and so this is a self-discovery program. It's a discovery of others. It's, a, it's also the ability to make people feel less isolated and less alienated as a result of experiences that they've had, which I think is very important. It is. And are you now using Zoom for your shows instead of Skype? Yes. Why? Uh, one, it is nominally at least more secure. Mm -hmm. And it's a much better mechanism for recording. Okay. It's, I've had, I've had one fail. I've recorded, I've been using this a year. I've probably done 60 shows with it or more. I've had one mm -hmm. fail. Skype has become so erratic since Microsoft took it over. It is a security nightmare. It's a software nightmare. And the quality was so bad that I just finally decided that this was the platform to use. Yeah. Plus the fact that people can use it from anywhere in the world. They can use phones. They can use any device they've got. Mm -hmm. Literally anything that's a computing device with a microphone and a camera, you can download an app for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know it's a paid service, right? Uh, to, yeah, it to... is. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're like recording beyond 40 minutes, it's it's it only records 40 minutes if it's for free right right yeah but uh yeah i i've noticed the security issues with skype and other uh, messenger apps and stuff like that so i've seen a trend going to zoom more that's why i thought i'd ask you yeah we tried using facetime the problem is not everybody has apple products so facetime has a very limited appeal and quite frankly i wasn't all that impressed with facetime either I don't like Apple as a whole. It's so restrictive. Yeah, I'm using a Mac, so just so you know okay. that. But I also have a Windows computer sitting over here to my left. And this yeah. computer also runs Linux. Mm. And if I had my choice, I'd be using Linux. Mm -hmm. Which actually you can run Zoom on Linux, so. Yeah, I, I, I threw out my Apple iPhone about five years ago. I, I, I almost smashed it against the wall. It was just so restrictive. I went to an Android phone. Yeah. Cellular phone. Ugh. All it, these companies, look, Google, Apple, Microsoft. Yeah. don't have any illusions about any of them. They're all part of SSP too. They are. Oh, and, uh, you know, some of those exotic uh, materials that go into making these devices. Sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, that's coming from other places. Yeah. And using, it actually listens and records you yeah it does yeah 
you know, I'm beyond worrying about what's recorded or what they know about me. Um, I think they know more about me than I probably am comfortable admitting myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, these webcam, webcam, smart TVs is probably recording you when you just took a shower and came out and you have your towel on your head and you have your ratty pajamas that you're wearing after your shower and they're recording your life. Secrets. I was told in 1998 that there were cameras and TVs then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, we're way down the road on this. I mean, the new TVs that come out. Then you could have probably isolated a camera and a TV. Now it's integrated into the screen itself at yeah. a fiber level. Yeah. So. Most of it, they don't care what you're talking about. It's keywords that they latch mm -hmm. on to, like UFO, yeah. terrorism, 9-11, like all those little things that has to do with disclosure. That's yeah. what they latch on and want to listen to the whole conversation. They don't care if you're prancing around after your bath, almost half ass naked. They don't care about that. No. It's being recorded and monitored, but hey, we don't need that, delete. Oh yeah, they just talked about UFOs and disclosure. We'll have a closer listen to this one. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. We'll make sure they don't get too close. Yeah, and the, the phenomenon I'm really interested in is like, um, before whistleblowers would be killed, right? If they came out with anything really interesting and classified, if they leaked that, they'd be gone. Yep. What is this today's phenomenon of, of people whistleblowing and leaking stuff? Is it pertinent or is it just, just, just talking, talking, talking? Uh, that's an interesting question. I've dealt with that before. And that's called perfusion, and that is basically putting out so much information and making sure that it's so convoluted and contaminated that you cannot possibly skim enough crust off the surface to get to the core of it. In other mm -hmm. words, if you look at the UFO disclosure exopolitics movement right now, and you look at what is paraded before us, it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really hard to define exactly what a pure approach is to this. I've used intuition. I've tried very hard to veer towards people that I felt were credible and true and to avoid people even though they were bigger names and could have brought us views and clicks and all of that stuff. But we're not monetizing anything right now. I mean, YouTube channel isn't monetized. Mm. I'm not charging for podcasts. Um, so what they've done is they've sown into it enough disinformation actors and people with fantastic tales and people who are mind controlled that it's very difficult to sort out the good information. And the higher, if you go, let's just say on the levels, because there's levels to all this, um, because it's been around so long, coast to coast. And then you go to like the History Channel, Gaia TV, uh, Fade to Black, whatever popular programs they are, the further down the line to go, a little closer to the truth and the real truth is actually the underground, which mm -hmm. is what we are. We're the underground, we're the resistance. And we get away with this now. They, yes, they used to kill whistleblowers, and yes, they used to silence them. But now they marginalize them, they ghettoize them. And as the web continues to evolve, we'll be ghetto, ghettoized, marginalized, and disappeared. They'll never mm -hmm. have to kill us. They don't have to. But people get people still get a lot of subscribers and hits, even the get a, even though we're the ghetto style ones. You know, if we have something interesting to say, people might listen. They might, but here's, and that's you know, what's a lot of hits now? Is a million a lot? Is fifty thousand a lot? I don't care. I, I look. Oh, we just had a video that got six thousand hits in three days, and I'm like, that's phenomenal because that's probably the fastest moving video I've ever had. 
Yeah, usually people want some information that's that's credible and there's something there in the information of what was said. That's why it gets a lot of hits. If, if, if it's just sensational, whatever, it might not even get the hits. If there's information in it that's that's needful and useful to somebody, that's where the hits come in, the views, because it had some information that somebody wanted out of it. Yeah. That's that's basically what I think about it. I don't care about the hits and stuff. For me, when I watch information on YouTube, I want to see something worth listening to and seeing yeah. some information out of it. And there's also there's also agents creeping about in this community, like Stephen Greer, anonymous yeah. said he's CIA mm -hmm. possibly. Mm -hmm. um, well, anonymous three... didn't just say that. We said that. I've had two people on my show that have said. And these were independent people who had never talked to each other and said they knew that Stephen Greer was CIA going back to the 1970s. So mm. Anonymous and, is a little slow coming to that one. And the, there's other agents creeping around from sure. the th three letter agencies that are infiltrate, infil, have infiltrated this community since the 80s and before. They put out this info or I've been called a disinfo agent or even a cabal agent in somebody's article. I'm like, oh, wow, you think so highly of me. I, I, I got somebody's attention <laughs> when I'm neither nor. I'm not a disinfo agent nor a cabal agent. But oh, I know people, no, I know people that were sent in to infiltrate it. Uh, they've mm. told me they were sent in to infiltrate it. And in oh, some wow. cases, they're actually double agents, oddly enough. They actually are helping us. Wow. So, I've so been, by admission, I've been told, yes, I was sent in to infiltrate that group. I'm part of part of a project group. Wow. And my assignment was to infiltrate alternative media. That's that's directly been told to me by at least one person. Wow. Who's very well, I, open about it. Well, it's been written about me that I'm some dis disinfo agent or cabal agent. I'm like, uh, nope, neither nor, but. I'm, thank you so much that you thought so highly of me to to mm. to to think that yeah. about me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm flattered. None of those, but still flattered. Um, At the same time, you know, the numbers, whatever they are, if we reach the people that are supposed to hear what we're saying, that's a successful message. Yes. I mean, I spent seven years building what little momentum I have with this show just because I'm stubborn and because I like doing this and because I'm committed to it. And mm -hmm. quite honestly, I don't look at the numbers very often. I don't get excited by them. I don't get depressed by them. I don't go, well, why can't I have a show as big as Jimmy black? I like, that's not what I do. That's, this is about reaching a certain group of people who yeah. need not only to be connected to the information, but to the community that is around this. Exactly. And I think yeah. the real attack is on the community. I don't even think it's on the information anymore. I think the real attack is on the community. It is. And what I discovered about YouTube, like last year, I didn't even know that people subscribed on YouTube, <laughs> I discovered it by accident, and I hid the stats. Uh, nobody can see how many subscribers or followers I have, or how many people have liked or disliked my videos. I've just hidden all that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you want to see something, just see see it for the value of the information and the people that are there, not for the hits and subscribers. Like I said, I only discovered last year that you could you could subscribe to somebody's channel and follow them. I had no idea. I was just posting stuff because I want this out as a archival history. It, yeah. It's yeah. we're producing information. This is all archival information. This is actually history on the fly. We're basically documenting. Yeah. Yeah. We have the capability to yeah. do it for free to post for free. And that's, that, that's what had me exciting so excited and it being exciting i was just posting posting and posting and then i realized you know what i can post when i have something to post not mm -hmm. for just the sake of posting everything that i have all at once 
you need to you need to space it out and yeah. um yeah. not get overburdened with the amount of info that you have to share. You can just share it as you can. And the the, the order of discovery, there's a discovery. You know, there mm-hmm. I know people, I've seen people who wake up and they're like they're just furiously digging, digging, digging the information. Yeah. And there's that whole sense of discovery that goes with finding information. And I remember this feeling myself. Um, it was a little harder back when I was doing it because there really wasn't an internet. I mean, like I said, the, the early internet, the Usenet, but this was printed material and it was connecting with groups and it was, you know, it was a much more difficult process. But this is a discovery process now. And at the same time, people have to be aware that the web now is constantly being scrubbed. Yes. And documents are taken offline. You know, I t- I've told everybody, screenshot, save things, PDF them, put them on hard drives, put them on flash drives. Because I, I, have, I have few remorses in life, but one of them is some of the things that I failed over the years to archive that are now gone. Same stuff. Um, yeah. Good example of there was a really good website that talked about Atlantean history and what happened in Atlantis. I went, I copied, I sat there copying page by page, 100 pages of all of this, this information. I saved it as a Word document. And then I, um, you know, I worked on it to make it nice looking and I saved mm-hmm. it into a p- yep. PDF. Half a year later, that website is gone. And the, that that information is gone, but I saved it and I actually put it up on my website as a you know a link to the document. So I save anything that intuitively feels like good information to me. I save it. I always save it. Um, or you know if if you can't save it, screenshot it, copy it any way you can, just to to have a. Yeah some a file of it somehow i have a friend of mine up in new york who uh, was doing extensive research his his background's kind of interesting his father was actually part of the secret government as well and he discovered this as he got older and he actually was locating documents early on in the time of the internet and he was telling me a few months ago that he has law, uh, bankers boxes full of the stuff that he just he just printed it out on a dot matrix printer and he saved all this now he it's hardly retrievable at this point because it's all printed out and none of it's ever been indexed and filed and you know all the things that we should do with this data but it was an interesting story about somebody who just went i'll just print all this stuff and it's reams and reams of paper or that old green bar type stuff i guess that they used back in the days of dot matrix you probably don't even remember that Oh, uh, I know what a dot matrix printer is. Okay. Uh, we, I never used one, but I know how it works. Ugh. All I can say is blech. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that was the technology we had back then. The laser printers were thousands of dollars. Some of them still are, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the dot matrix stuff was on very thin paper, like greenish white. And mm-hmm. Um, it's probably hard to scan it. You can't put it through like a scanner and have Horrible it. Horrible resolution. It was DPIs, dots per inch. Um, usually the media, the print media wore out rather fast. And the, the only saving grace was it would kind of almost semi perforate the paper. So you could take a pencil and scratch over it to read it sometimes. But yeah, yeah horrible stuff. So... I mean, is it is it very interesting information what that person has? Probably some of it is, and probably some of it isn't because of what he was looking for. Mm-hmm. Because he was tracing who his father worked for mm. and what his father was doing. Because obviously he was he had he had his day job, let's say, which kind of bled over into a security job because the company was owned by the company. Mm. Um, Purolator. Ever hear of Purolator? Yeah. 
Yeah. It de- it delivers stuff to universities and major companies. Yeah, well, they deliver a lot of things and Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting company. Hey, you know what? It's getting late for me and mm-hmm. um this has been a great conversation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it uh it's 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 very interesting and I just like talking to people. I, I don't care who you are, where you're from. <laughs> just uh, you know, if energetically your your vibe vibes with mine and it's just honest and there's no there's no bias here, no nothing. You don't want anything from me, I don't want anything nope. from you. It's just a nice conversation. It's this wasn't conversation. even a yeah. was not even a formal interview. It just it just clicked, so we chatted. Right, right. And that's that's kind of the point of of these conversations. I'm calling these these interviews displaced voices. Because they're kind of the kind of conversations I want to have that it's not a formal interview. Yeah. And it's, you know, I want them to be with people who have not entered the mainstream or are not talking about mainstream subjects. This is about the kind of yeah. stuff that just goes on in the, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's alternative media. It's, it's, At it's, its best. Yeah, it's yeah. even paranormal, sci-fi stuff. Um, it's it's a discovery discovery layer mm-hmm. at its at its as purest of getting to know each other and discovering your layers, my layers, and you know yeah. what there yeah. is between the people. I I want to know the people. The information is fascinating, but I also want to know the person behind the information. Yeah. Because who you are reflects on your information. Your experiences reflect the information you put out. Yeah, it does. Yep, very much. So it, it's it's all about uh, it's all about the people, the information, what you have, what you want, what you need, and just just putting it all out there. I don't. You know, I'll put it all out there, what I have, because I have nothing to fear from this. Um, I don't care about being judged. And I'm independent, just my YouTube channel and just me. I do it all myself. Mm-hmm. I don't let any other uh, outside parties into my business because then my business is no longer mine. Yeah. Yep. It, it, it's controlled by somebody else. So that's how it happens. You want something right done, do it yourself. Exactly. Yeah, we're kind of DIY people, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. get the screwdriver out. Let's tear this thing apart. Yep. Well, for let's sure. wrap it there. One more time yep. um, for the end of this, your website. Messages from a star traveler. There we go. And it sounds to me like I need to spend some more time there because there's a lot of deep pockets in that. that oh, it has everything mixed in together. The the good, tea good. stuff, the the um, the SSP stuff, the spiritual woo woo juju art. I I I, ba- I basically put it. I stuck it all on one place because it's like a huge large archive of mm-hmm. of the fun, the weird, and just the weirder. It's one of the weirdest things that I've ever created. It has I've stuck everything in it. Uh, nice. It was predominantly ET in the beginning. And then I'm like, you know what? It, it, it all correlates together. It starts from See, the ET. Same process. We just that's the process. It comes. Yep. It's it's all starts from the ET branch, but then it comes to the secret space programs, the mind control, the all of it, even the occult stuff, the spirituality, the magic learning. It's all part of this whole big picture. It's 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 it, it, it's. You know, you look through a lens, a magnifying lens, it's all part of the same wheel of life, the circle of life, because it's all interconnected. So I just thought, you know what? Let it be a whole archive about all of it. You skim, you search through what you want on it. You'll, you'll find tons. Uh, some of it could be relevant. Some of it could just be boring for you. Because I talk about magic. I talk about art. I talk about ETs. I talk about SSPs. I talk about how to banish banish something out of your life how to depossess yourself i mentioned those things so I talk about all of it i don't just focus on one thing i also have awakening cosmic reality show where i have interviews podcasts vlogs uh weird presentations whatever i've put it out there i, I just let it all hang out 
and you can just sort through what you want and what you don't want. Very cool. Yeah. Elena, thanks for joining me for a displaced conversation, kind of like sitting at the side of the road, just talking to each other. It's been great sharing a part of the journey. Let's do this again and let's maybe yeah. dig a little deeper into some of that weird stuff you got on your website. Sure. Uh, I, ju I just jump in into the rabbit hole and pull something out. Yeah. It all, cool. There's always something that comes up and you can pull out something that's, that's valid or important to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. We'll close out the recording here. Yeah. Um, to you folks out there who are watching, seeing, hearing this in some way. Um, I hope this is of value and uh, we'll see you the next time we do this. Mm -hmm.